<laughs> okay, Jackie, turn it off. Okay, Jackie, turn it off. p.m. and the first order of business is Pledge of Allegiance. James, will you lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the flag of the And that is the table. Councillor Coker. Here. Councillor Bjarnson. Here. Councillor Whitney. Here. Councillor Hooker. Here. Karen Hollett. Here. Councillor Kenyon. Councillor Kenyon is going to be a little bit late. All right. Any additions, corrections, or adjustments, James? No. Okay. I don't have any either. Um, first thing up, public comment. So we'll go ahead and start with the people in the room. If you have public comment, it's three minutes. And we ask that you state your name and address. All right, and then if anyone on the Zoom has public comment, just go ahead and unmute yourself and raise your emoji hand if you can find it. But if you cannot, just go ahead and unmute and start talking. Depending upon what format you're using, it can be difficult to find. Can you scroll through and see if you see any hands raised since we do have a good. All right, moving on. I don't see any hands raised. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, mayor comments, announcements, and proclamations. I do not have any announcements or proclamations. Um, we have a really busy agenda tonight, so I'm going to keep it super light and hold my um, report for next meeting. Council, does any councilors have comments? No, uh, well, I'm just wondering um, the status of council chambers. Yeah, I can report on that. So we were working in there most of the day yesterday, was it? With um, our IT guy, got a lot of the wiring um, uh, hung up. And hopefully Tuesday will be our last day to get all this stuff installed. Every Most everything is purchased, mm -hmm. but um, things are coming together. And yeah, we're kind of working around his schedule, so. Thank you. Yes. Um, any council comments or additions? Okay. We have a motion for consent agenda. Can I make a motion we approve the consent agenda? I'll second that. Motion made by Councillor Whitney and seconded by Councillor Coker. Is that who we call for the vote? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Mayor Hollett. Hi. Councillor Bjarnson? Aye. Councillor Whitney? Aye. Councillor Hooker? Aye. Councillor Coker? Aye. Motion passed. Thank you, guys. First thing up your city council business is committee members. We have David. David Acklin for the Public Safety Committee, Sherry Kendall for the WAC Subcommittee, Barbara Council Bernie for Parks and Community Services. And are all three of those people on Zoom right now? I see Sherry. Barbara. I see Barbara. I'm right. Dave is here. Dave, okay, awesome. David, right? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so let's go ahead and start off. Which one do you have first on the agenda? Dave. Okay. Okay. Do you want to read David Acklin's? I'm, I'm not. Okay. I'm gonna, I think I'll have to review this. Okay. Does everybody have David Acklin's public safety application in front of them? Yes. Okay. Does anyone have any questions for David? 
I don't. I'd just like to say I think he'd be a good addition to the public safety um, committee. Him and I spoke briefly a few times on this, and I think he'd be good. Yeah, I think you and I spoke on the phone recently as well yeah. about it, right? Yeah. yeah. So I'll just ask you a quick question. Uh, what is your interest in the public safety committee? Well, you know, I've lived here. I'm not a lightweight here, but I've lived here for about 35 years. And I think I, you know, I, I've seen where the town has been and I see where the town is kind of leaning towards. So I I feel like, you know, time to be to step up to the plate and help out where I can. Thank you. Any other counselors have questions for David? All right. Um, let's go ahead and interview, even though they're on separate committees, let's interview each of them and then we can make a motion <clears throat> at the end, unless you guys want to do it separately or together. What do you think, Bobby? Um, they are different committees. Different, so I think it might be worth solving them separately. Mm -hmm. But make motions separately? Yeah. Okay. Fine. Is there a motion for Mr. Acklin? Um, I make a motion we confirm David Acklin as a member of the Public Safety Committee. I'll second that. Motion made by Councillor Whitney and seconded by Councillor Hooker. Mm -hmm. Is there any other discussion? And let the record show that Councilor Kerry just walked in. Thank you, Jackie. Since we're in discussion, do you have any questions for Mr. Ackland? He's here to apply for the Public Safety Committee. No, I reviewed the application okay. still. Jackie, will you call for the vote? Mayor Mullet? Aye. Councilor Coker? Aye. Councilor Kenyon? Aye. Councilor Diarmuth? Aye. Councilor Hooker? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Thank you, guys, and welcome to Public Safety Committee. Thank you. Um, the chair for that is Councillor Coker over here, which you've already met, so you can probably get in touch with her and James about meetings. And again, thank you. We definitely need help on that committee. Thank you. All right, next one up is Sherry Kendall, and she is on the Zoom. Let's do this one. Just um, <clears throat> Sherry, did you have anything to say first? Uh, yes, so James brought it to my attention. I forgot an important piece um, and pardon me for not getting that in. I, I have a um, pretty demanding day job <laughs> and uh, it just slipped my mind. But the reason that I'm interested in, in being part of this committee and serving this um, in this way is um, I just, for one, I want to give back. I've been here since uh, Christmas Eve, so I'm a newbie um, and I have fallen in love with this town. I'm already um, uh, involved in bringing some services here to uh, assist folks that are struggling with addiction. And um, I've had many conversations with the mayor um, about ways in which we can enhance this community and really serve the community. Um, and I believe I have a skill set that would be um, helpful to the committee. Um, I have been um, a successful businesswoman um, in the public sector for well over 20 years. I run a small business and I also have a social service background. So I think um, project management skills I have, public speaking, and then both business and social service skills. Um, I think I have some skills to add uh, and can really assist this committee in reaching its goals. Thank you, Sherry. Any counselors have any questions for her? Um, well, I'll just say I don't have any questions. I have got a chance to know you, and I know everything you said is very true about yourself. You're very community oriented, and you definitely have a social service background. So I would love to see you on the WAC committee. Um, I think you bring a lot of good ideas to the table. Thank you. If there is, yeah. So, how long have you lived in Oak Ridge? um since christmas eve okay and so do you know if we have any rules for committee member like i don't we do, i don't um, think so i don't think there's a residency requirement for time on committee members yeah not okay on, each committee has its own rules and rules for okay perfect. Yeah. i just wanted to make sure i thought about it too but i remembered we don't okay oh, cool. um then unless anybody else has anything um i make a motion we confirm sherry kendall 
is a lot to subcommittee member. I'll second that. Motion made by Councillor Whitney and seconded by Councillor Coker. Any more discussion? All right, Jackie, will you call for the vote? Councillor Coker? Aye. Councillor Whitney? Aye. Mayor Hollis? Aye. Councillor Coker? Aye. Councillor Quinion? Aye. <laughs> Councillor Bjornson? Aye. All right, motion carried. Thank you, Sherry. Appreciate even more time you're dedicating to the city. Thank you. All right, next one up is Barbara Council Bernie for the uh, Parks and Recreation, Parks and Community Service Committee. Barbara, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? You got to unmute yourself first. Thanks. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mayor Hollett. Um, my name is Barbara. I'm also kind of new to the area like Sherry. Um, I applied for this position because I saw the open um, committee positions and I think this is probably the best one I could contribute to. Um, I think it's important to help your community if you're able to and I'd like to make a little more time to volunteer. Um, <clears throat> I used to be a park ranger for Oregon State Parks so I really love stewarding the natural resources and um, the places for people to come together and play. So I'm interested in learning more about the committee and helping. Any questions for Barbara? I don't have a question, but I, I, I do want to say that uh, I don't think I've ever seen anyone come into community and become so involved so quickly. Mm -hmm. Barbara, I, I see her everywhere. I go to rain meetings, the fundraiser for the, uh, for the new park, Van Park, uh, everywhere I turn. Um, while she also offers a lot of time, community garden. Um, so I, I, I think it's great to have her and um, great addition. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Awesome addition to the committee. So. Very excited to have you board. Any other questions or comments? All right, do I have a motion? Um, if you want to make a motion to uh, appoint Barbara Council Bernie uh, to the Parks and Community Services Committee. I'll second that. Motion made by Councillor Whitney and seconded by Councillor Coker. Any more discussion? Councillor Kenyon? Aye. Mayor Hollett? Aye. Councillor Whitney? Aye. Councillor Bjornsson? Aye. Councillor Hooker? Aye. Councillor Hooker? Aye. Motion carried. Welcome aboard, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up on the agenda is 9.2, and tonight we are swearing in two of our fire department personnel. The first one up is our new fire chief, Hollett, and the second one will be our EMS coordinator, Jim Cole. And James is going to swear in uh, Scott. Right one. <laughs> So. All right, Chief Hollis, so you raise the right hand and we'll be after me. So, I, Scott Hollis, is called to swear or affirm. I, Scott Hollis, is called to swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America, that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America, and the Constitution of the State of Oregon, and the Constitution of the State of Oregon. And all laws thereof, and all laws thereof, and that I will faithfully and honorably, that I will faithfully and honorably form my duties, form my duties as fire chief, as fire chief of the Oak Ridge Fire and EMS Department, the Oak Ridge Fire and EMS Department, according to the best of my abilities, according to the best of my abilities, so help me out, so help me out. Congratulations, you are our new fire chief.
I'll turn it over to you. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get the end of the picture. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Our next one up is our EMS coordinator, Jim Cole. <laughs> All right, raise your right hand. Hi, Edward James Cole. Hi, Edward James Cole. Do you solemnly swear or affirm, I do solemnly swear, that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America, that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America, and the Constitution of the State of Oregon, and the Constitution of the State of Oregon, and the laws thereof, and the laws thereof. And I will faithfully and honorably perform the duties as firefighter and paramedic EMS coordinator, and I will faithfully Perform the duties of EMS coordinator, firefighter, paramedic, of Oak Ridge Fire and EMS, of Oak Ridge Fire and EMS, according to the best of my ability, according to the best of my ability. So, how do you go? So, how do you <laughs> Congratulations, Chief and Jim Cole. Thank you. Just a, a kind of a brief introduction for Jim. He comes to us with a bachelor's degree in public health administration and a master's degree in higher education. Uh, he worked for Peace Health prior to coming to uh, our department and uh, was an injury prevention coordinator for the region, which includes Oregon, Washington, and let's go, yeah, Oregon, Washington. Um, he has more letters behind his name than the alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> and we are very, very fortunate to have him with us. Um, one of the things during the hiring process, uh, we set up a, a skill station. And part of that skill station was to write an essay on community paramedicine or integrated um, mobile integrated healthcare. Uh, and that's something that I've been wanting to accomplish for Oak Ridge for a few years now, but have not had the, the kind of the help and support that it takes to do that. And Jim has some uh, very good expertise in that area. Um, he's also an instructor for community paramedicine. And um, I believe that he and I can work together and look at the feasibility of bringing community paramedicine to Oak Ridge, which would um, greatly enhance the healthcare in Oak Ridge. Uh, this would be for folks that just charged from the hospital may need some additional uh, respite care and um, we would participate in that and with that said um, Jim wrote a very good essay on community paramedicine and he's going to share a little bit of that with us right now. so um, we have in front of you some slides I will go through the slides but to say that Mobile integrated healthcare is well established here in the United States and especially here in the state of Oregon. There are probably over a dozen mobile integrated healthcare programs throughout the state, um, usually through municipality fire departments and some EMS services. Uh, mobile integrated healthcare is the ability to use our paramedics when we're not on emergency calls to help people in the way that they need help, whether that's an older person who has difficulty with sight, reconciling their medication. It's helping somebody do dressing changes after they've gotten out of the hospital so that they don't get uh, sick uh, or infected. Um, and it's kind of endless what we can do. 
It would be uh, under our medical director, through our chief, through the department. And we're looking at funding that would be brought into the city to fund the position, not any cost from the city itself to, to make it happen. Um, as I've been a paramedic here part-time for several years, I've seen a lot of our residents who just need a little extra helping hand. And it would keep them from having to go to the emergency room, having to get admitted, you know, admitted to the hospital. And for people that are getting out of the hospital, it could be somebody to go and see them, make sure that they're on the road to wellness and not end up having to get um, admitted to the hospital. So the chief and I are going to be uh, doing a feasibility study where you're looking at funding and we'll probably have some community focus groups to find out what it is that our citizens want and need and see where we can begin to, to serve them even greater. Are there any questions? I don't have questions, just comments. Um, uh, I'll take my council hat off. So I work for senior <laughs> disability services. Um, I'm the area coordinator and I cover Oak Street Plaza Health. And I do like older Americans Act programs and can help connect with the rest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you my information. <laughs> yeah, we would really, we're hoping that we would kind of be the hub uh, where we would be able to bring a lot of community organizations together mm -hmm. to network and be able to really draw on the strengths of a lot of things that are already here and enhance things that are happening. So yeah. that's, I think that's a key relationship. Yep. Any questions for Jim? You know, I totally support it. So thank you. I'm very excited as well. Yeah, once we have an official policy or uh, you know, program that we bring it to you for adoption for what it would look like and you would use a participation uh, in helping us form this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Congratulations. you. Thank you. All right, next up is Kathy Holston with the Transient Warming Center proposal. Kathy, do you want to maybe come up in the chair or whatever works for you? Uh, okay, so as you know, we have had a warming center here for quite a few years, and normally it's in the WAC. Um, obviously, it's not in the WAC this year. And so, putting our heads together with those of us um, who have been working there, um, we decided that it, the best course of action would be to ask the council if we can use the uh, community building at Rainwater. Um, you have before you the proposal. I hope it answers any questions that you may have about it. Um, we haven't we haven't put together all of the details. This is a general overview. First off, we need to have permission to use the community center. Um, so then we can move forward with some of the details. We know that we're going to have some storage issues. So we're hoping that the school can help us build things. We talked to um, the shop and they said yes, they could help with the storage units if we need something like that. But that's all to be decided later once we get permission to use it and we determine. You know, um, with James help where that would be a good place to be. Um, so, we're here for questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any questions? I know um, I have some, but I can wait. Oh, I was just wondering um, what other locations you guys looked at. We, um, to be frank, we don't have any other locations. Uh, we have not had any um, any input from any of the faith base. So we felt that the first uh, and best solution would be grandmothers. There isn't really any other public spaces that we can use to fulfill this mission. Um, and uh, unless someone wants to volunteer a very large auditorium that they own, um, that's about where we are. So just for clarification, you say the church has said no, basically? They have said no in the past. In helping you in any situations with this because of lots of different reasons and um, uh, and uh, so we we didn't we decided we wanted to do this first to see if this is an option. I have a couple of questions and yeah. I'm just going to say some of them just for transparency too. Um, as you're aware, the community 
building is used by other groups too. So let's say um, a family has it reserved for a memorial service or a birthday party or what have you. What are the plans for our days like that? Well, what we had talked about and James had suggested that one of the ways we can alleviate those kind of conflicts, recognizing that we don't have the warming center open every night, mm -hmm. only when it's um, when the temperature uh, or precipitation or wind chill factors, um, you know, deem that that is an important thing to save people's lives, um, that we can be flexible in that way. We can open later. I believe, and I don't, because I don't have your agenda, I know, yeah. I don't know what you propose. Was 8 it a.m.? Yeah. Okay. Was yeah. that if we do a later opening date, very, we very seldom have anybody using mm -hmm. the building after 8 o'clock. Um, there are times, of course, that, that might um, be a conflict, but we would have to work around it. Um, so I am familiar with the warming center. I haven't been to it, though. And I'm thinking of morning purposes, cleanup. What is the cleanup normally like? How much time does that take if somebody was to need the, the building at 8 a.m., say? Uh, well, typically, so we, everybody leaves by 7 in the morning, mm -hmm. and then it takes about 30 minutes, 45 minutes to do cleanup, sometimes not even that, depending, of course, on how many people are there. And also, that's an estimate because I don't know where we're going to be storing things. This is based on what we did at the, at the back. So I know where everything went there. We don't know where they're going to go here. And that was my next question about storage. So mm -hmm. as you know, not, not any storage, but right. the building there. Recognizing now, we had hoped that we would be able to use some of the cupboards that are already in the community center mm -hmm. to store the minimal amount of food we have. And those food are things like instant coffee, instant cocoa, instant um, oatmeal, that type of thing, power bars that we can give to folks. Uh, if we start at a later time, we recognize we won't be serving a meal at all. We won't have soup and stew available for anyone. We will just have morning food uh, available for those that come in. And as far as clean, typically what we did at the WAC was to, of course, empty the garbages, um, sweep the floors, mop the floors. So that was the minimal cleaning that we did. We did not clean bathrooms because the janitor cleaned the bathroom, and that would be the same here at the, uh, at the green wash. Right now, where are you storing things? They are still in the white book. Okay. And that was given, so you're very aware that there's no insurance. Yes, I'm very like aware. But is, James, is there any reason why we can't continue to store those items there with the expectation they know if the building was to catch on fire, we cannot reimburse for those things that are there? Is that agreed, is that agreed upon? Or? Well, I mean, we know that we need to pare down what we have there because we did get an influx of a lot of the um, Donations, donations that's everything. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we know that we'll have to pair some pair of that down. Um, but it would be inconvenient to store there and then have to bring it over whenever we wanted it mm -hmm. to, because the mats are are about six feet by three feet. Yeah, the and they fold yeah, they don't roll up, right? Yeah, they're just yeah. so um, that would be kind of okay. inconvenient. We'll have to work around that. We do have some issues as far as that. We're hoping that we can resolve. And for storage of the mats and things, we have asked to talk to the shop teacher at high school, and I have talked to Rita Dolan, the superintendent, and they are both in agreement with us that they could potentially build us a, a storage shed, which is like the wood sheds that they have made and given mm -hmm. the community members and that kind of thing, and they would be willing to do that. And if we had a place we could put that on the site at Green Waters. That could store our big, our big items like the mats and those things. Okay. And they would be locked. Yeah. That Is that a possibility? I was just talking okay. to Robert about that. Yes. Um, in fact, at the caretaker's house, there, there's a shed that city property is already stored in. Okay. There's a little bit of room in there that could be utilized. Yeah. But if, if the school wants to build another shed, it could be put um, right there. Okay. Awesome. So could we do something? I, I I definitely understand their need for wanting to open up at 6.30 and to be able to provide a hot meal. Um, is this something that we could just, you and Kathy have good communication. So most of the time she could be able to open at 6.30, but on a night that it's, you know, reserved, that just would be an unavailable night. So that they still could do it, could be meet in the middle somewhere. I mean, I know I see the recommendation is 8 p.m., but. Um, yeah, or at least 8 p.m. on Thursdays because that's the NA meeting. Okay. Um, right. Yeah, as long as there's that understanding. Yeah. But, or if someone reserves it and they want to go till 9 p.m. or something like mm -hmm. that, I think it's 
would be flexible with that. I mean, my concern is for city and loss of the rentals. I would want to lose a rental because mm -hmm. they want to go to 9 p.m. Right. Yeah. As long as they're fine with that. My memory serves me right. It's very minimal days, right? We're talking like five days through the whole season or five to ten or something. Yeah, like that I'm wrong. so unpredicted, obviously, because yeah. it's weather driven. Um, but we we were open maybe 12 days last time. Okay. Um, and some of those days while we opened, we closed mm -hmm. because we didn't have any clients come. So, um, you know, if we're there and we're there an hour and no one has shown up um, or whatever that cutoff is, depending on when we've opened. Um, then we just call the, the next group of volunteers that were to come in and say, don't come. You know, we didn't have any classes, so we just closed that account again. So even that part is unpredictable. Um, but James is, one of James's concerns, and I agreed with it, was um, was the consistency of the opening time. Um, you know, our community, and, and while this is on the agenda item as transit, it's not transit. It's, it's for everyone in the community. We have had people use the, set, the warming center whose power got cut off unexpectedly and mm -hmm. pop in, you know, it's like, what could I say? You know, it's like, yeah, so it's, it's for travelers. It's not just a transit community, but that being said, it is important to have a consistent time um, so that, that that transit population knows what time it is for what day. It's kind of, it might be a stretch to say, well, every day we open up, except if it's a Thursday, We'll be open yeah, yeah. So I don't know that. Yeah. I, I don't have it's any hard to advertise if it's message to yes. that mm -hmm. demographic as well. So it's something to consider. I think you might, the council is already committed to renting space on Thursdays. Thursdays. Yeah, yeah. Tony. Okay. I agree with the idea that consistent time is better, which is why I was suggesting a consistent and so the volunteers would have to work less, but I. I'm open to whatever counts. What so. were your hours when you were at the back? Um, normally we opened by by seven, and so we were there by six thirty. We opened at seven, um, and then we stayed open and and closed up by seven in the morning. First call. Shuffle them off. Council, can you make any questions? Sorry, I keep. That's okay. Ah. <laughs> I do have some questions. I'm sure you're familiar, Kathy, that I used to volunteer for the Warming Center. So I have a book somewhere. I didn't find it today to review it, but I'm pretty positive that uh, when I was there, the degrees that would allow it to open was 29 degrees. Yes. And that was based on the Eagle Warming Center yes. threshold and standards that they've set. So have you checked? To see whether or not it's okay to change that, it is. Or, that is up to us. We don't. We don't have to follow what the Eden Warming Center does. Um, the Eden Warming Center set out those standards for themselves. We followed them originally because they were also covered by St. Vinny's, and St. Vinny's at one point was covering us, and so asked that we adhere to their their criteria. Um, so we no longer have to do that. Um, so we've kind of set our own, and most of those who have been working there recognize that that is a really low temperature, especially up here. Um, and we felt that if we could pump it up a little bit, that would be a, a better fit for our community. Um, and so that brings up another good point I wanted to ask was uh, pretty positive that I was told that the city was never paying the excess insurance and that that was St. Vincent the Falls? That's a very good question. That was my understanding for a couple of years, although St. Vincent has said they never did that, but we believe that they did. So, but that point is actually moved because they have said they won't do that. So as in the last year we did it, the city covered the insurance. I can't hear her. Um, so as in the last uh, season that we were open, the city covered the insurance. Which is the advantage of doing it at Green Waters? The city already has the insurance. We had to pay extra insurance the last two years because we had pallet cuts there or those extra huts outside, and they required a different insurance level. Um, and then, if I'm not mistaken, the price of insuring those even went up after the insurance companies who insure had a, a time to get some history behind insuring them and re recognize that the damage to them 
uh, in many communities, not just ours, was just kind of continuous. So. Um, sorry, Mayor, something just came to my attention from Public Works. There's a building by the WAC, by the ball field, that is not used by the school in the winter. What, what would you call it? It's the WAC, it's the, it's the concession stand, bathrooms, and storage facility. Oh. Uh, it belongs to the city. We just we share the uh, the use of it during uh, their storage. It's not being used during the winter. It's not being used during the winter. It's got full electric. It's got a small kitchen. It's got separate rooms. It's got bathrooms. Um, you know, I've never walked in there. I, so I, I don't know what it looks <laughs> like. I'm I'm not 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 is everything needed for the And, and, and we have, have, and it's we already have, down by the back. It's already which would be a better position. It'd be better for people in town, deeper in town. Yeah, yeah. 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 it would be. I, I'd definitely be willing to take and look stuff that's already stored that he wants to do. Yeah, we would just have to ask, ask the school to remove their stuff. Right. Uh, and I don't know whether the school does the school ensure that or do we ensure that? We ensure that during our time. And then would I, I with our insurance agent, we, we last year we paid four hundred dollars a month extra uh, to do it at the WAC and, and uh -huh. he checked and that would remain the same it's for running the program. But was that for the pallet houses that she explained? No, it's no. He said we have to pay four hundred dollars a month extra mm -hmm. to run a sleepover. Shelter. But is that a month? I'm sorry. Yeah. So yeah. Months. So it's okay. per month. And, and the other catch, and that's why I kind of wrote the suggestion here. <clears throat> even if you just use it one day a month, four hundred dollars. Right. So one of my suggestions, uh, what's being proposed is it's run November fifteenth to March fifteenth. We could trim that down, you know, by starting December first. That saves us four hundred dollars. And I know it's just four hundred dollars. Right. right. But you know, I like to pinch pennies wherever we can. So yeah. <laughs> so if we started December first, then we could actually go all the way through March, the entire month of March, rather than stopping March fifteenth, because we're already paying for the entire month month of March anyway. Yeah. So just an idea you know, that that would say it's four hundred, or you could do just December, January, February. That's only twelve hundred dollars. We can decide in February if we yes. need. need March. What the weather is looking like. Yeah. Don, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks for bringing that up. Is I'm wondering if it's not an appropriate time now to say, hey, why don't we look into this some more, get new insurance quotes for that building, let them go and tour the building, find yeah. out the comfort level, and come back to the next meeting. Okay. That is, that we could do that, um, but I, just a clarification, the insurance guy said it's It'll be four hundred dollars a month, no matter where we have it. It's because it's for the program. That for the oh, city, yeah. Down. So that'll stay the same. It's for oh. the city, not the building. It's for us to be able to have overnight. Right. So council could pass a resolution tonight saying approve the program and the rental at either building, but then decide on when you want it to open. You know, November fifteenth or December first, when you have to close. My preference would be obviously the WAC building if that is suitable for you guys because it sounds less complicated. I certainly <laughs> like to see it. We didn't have yeah. to build anything if we could yeah. um, store everything in there. Yeah. As long as I mean, because I'm not familiar with the building at all, I want to make sure that the outside lighting is a, is appropriate and, and all that stuff. But I can't imagine that it's not. If it's not, we need to fix that anyways, right? Yeah, and, and anytime I'm told the lights are out, yeah, fixed. yeah, that can be. And would you be able to run the um uh, the cameras out there? Is the Wi-Fi is still there. The Wi-Fi is not Yeah, I don't know if it's been paying for that. Would be. We were uh, discussing about putting cameras on the WAC anyways here recently. Well, there are cameras at, at the WAC inside for the exterior. We don't have anything on the exterior. Like inside the WAC, there are cameras right now, but they run off their own. Well, it's not a necessity, but it, it was nice to have cameras, um, mm -hmm. that camera ability to be able to watch the door. Um, um, so I just wanted to make a comment. So we have we do have the MOU with the school, so I don't see why that wouldn't be an issue to be able to use that building for this time. Um, and I've been in there, and there's quite a bit of room. Um, 
separate bathrooms, and it's fenced. So, mm -hmm. and the fence can be locked. So, you can have some other like, safety measures that you may or may not want to use if we make that choice. But, um, yeah, I think it's a really good alternative because it's really within the, the hub of the community and where, um, where you find the most needy people that really could use that. Go ahead. The only other thing that we'll, we'll need to check is the MOU on the actual dates because I believe they take over in March. Okay. The school district. But I'll have to confirm. So, do we feel comfortable mm -hmm. making a motion tonight and just pending that it works out that way? You guys have a go ahead to proceed. Yeah, we could work out the details. Yeah. So it's just the main town decision council, council will window, window open it like November 15th or December 1st. Is $20 difference. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you can pass a motion that says we support the idea, we'll pay for the insurance, mm -hmm. we open the window win at the Greenwaters building or the building by the WAC by the baseball. Historically, <laughs> 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 no, we have kind of always shared with Brandon that November 15th, but you believe the Yeah, last year it was yeah, good. Yeah, I'd be surprised if we have anything before December 5th or 6th. Right. Okay. You all know Ken, right? Yeah. He works with us too. Yeah. <laughs> you know Ken very well. Yeah, Don. Yeah. So um, the one thing that I would okay. like to find out about is whether or not we could pursue or they could pursue um, grant funding for future and or if it was possible sooner rather than later. Um, to cover that insurance cost, I don't know if that's a possibility, but it seems like something might be out there. Um, just because I worry that we're going to get pushback for tax dollars being spent on that. So I wanted to also ask, do um, <clears throat> what what fund do you plan on utilizing for the uh, the expense. It's, it's actually already written into our insurance policies because uh, it's already in our budget because it was last year. So when I asked Rex about that, our insurance agent, he said, oh, that's already line item. And I mean, we're already, sorry, he didn't say line item. He said, it's already in your insurance policy because we, we assumed we were going to do it again this year. So it never got taken out. Oh, so you think it's already been budgeted? It's already been budgeted. Yeah. And you remember... What budget that, that administration or insurance? Yeah, insurance. 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 He's saying it was factored into the big insurance number. Right. Those okay. Months. Okay. So if we decided not to do it at all, said no, we would. It would get, actually be six. Right. I think it. I think it's six. I have to come back. Four hundred a month. I just can't even know. Any other questions? Sorry, I just have. have couple of my mind's going too many places. Um, a lot of people that I know or see have animals. So are they also allowed in there? And if so, how do you know that they're, or how do you, if something happens that somebody gets bitten, what happens then? We have pet carriers, but they're, um, okay. they're required to keep them in the pet carrier. Okay. And also, um, Trudy Hammond has reached out to us and said, if for some reason we had someone up here that had a dog that didn't look like it was going to be able to stay there, either you know because he wasn't comfortable being in a kennel or for whatever reason, that she would be willing to come down and um, take the animal back to her place and and take care of it Good. for that individual. Okay. Because we do sometimes. I mean, I've never seen an aggressive dog in there, but we've had kitties in there and we have something. Okay. Good. Um, so it was over hearing conversations. <laughs> um, so it sounds like we may need to look at the MOU closely and more closer to see um, what dates the school actually takes over. And so I think Dawn was on the right path earlier when she said to come back with something a little more worked out and then make a vote on it. Um, because we still are looking at possibly going into December before we would really want to open anyway, before you would want to open. So I, I would really like to see um, something that's 
a proposal that's more um, worked out with a little more detail since we know that we have a few more options at this point. Um, I'll just see something a little more specific. So next council day too. November 3rd. It come, comes really quick. So. Yeah. Is that yeah. enough time for you guys to look into the MOE with the school? Oh, sure. Isn't their sports are over, right? <laughs> they, they start the softball in February. Okay. So, so if they need date in February that we can answer the date on the softball Yeah. But they move all their stuff back. They'll move all their stuff back. So can we we have a consensus that we want to move forward with that building? We at least can leave James, Kathy, and Susan and Tim here with the idea that that's the direction we want to move, and you guys work out the details. And if we have the councils okay, then we can do that. I mean, I think we have folks that are that are a little bit chomping on the bit and wondering if we can't get that building, we're going to have to do some some figuring out, or we're just going to have to tell the community we're sorry we don't do that. So that is on the council. I can say for myself, I am very, very supportive of Robert and Rick's and James's idea. Um, yes. I'm very, very supportive of that. And I would support the other idea as well. I've had mm -hmm. numerous people come to me and say, what is the city doing about this? And, you know, the truth is it is not the city's absolute responsibility, but morally, I think we all feel that it is. I've had a long talk with Ken about it. And I honestly am really thankful that you guys came forward with the plan. So mm -hmm. I think it's really important. Yeah, I agree. And I think we could be the uh, sorry. So I think we could easily come up, up with a consensus and agree that we would want to move forward that would mm -hmm. allow you to feel like that's okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, I do agree with that statement as well, but I'd also um, like to see if we do come back to this, um, maybe the agreement that we would be agreeing to. That could be, yeah. you know, they look at the building, you write up the agreement, everybody's ready to sign, and we can just bring it through. And so, yeah. as related really to what you just said, I think it's important that you all understand that this is not an organization that has the ability to sign. We are not a group that has a 501c3. We're not, I mean, we are volunteers in the community. Cool. Who are doing this for our community through the past of the city. So we would all be very uncomfortable putting our signature down to something like that. So yeah. just so you know that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. She's right. Like for the insurance policy, it's volunteer, city volunteers. Mm -hmm. That's why we have the insurance policy. So if somebody slips and falls, it's not their responsibility. It's the city's. Right. Hence why I have that insurance. So. So that just begs a little bit more. Okay. Um, so then uh, is your group under the Egan Warming Center or no. are you under the city? We are a group of community members who are working with the city to establish something like this. They would be signing the city volunteer forms like they did last year. Okay. But okay. that must have been a first because it's never been part of the process before. How did that start? That, that was where I was going with that. We didn't sign volunteer forms with the city last year. We, we, yeah. we found signed forms that had been prepared quite a long time ago. Yes. <laughs> as far as who you are, what you are, that type of thing. And I think that probably originated when well, when they were affiliated with the city. Yeah. So, uh, so no, we did not sign volunteer forms with the city last year. What are, the, what are the city volunteer forms that Brian came up with? Those are for yeah. the other city committees. Is what she's saying is they're not under the city. They're just oh, a group they're, well, of people doing a good thing. We have to need to look into this because. Yeah, that would be insurance. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Our insurance agent yeah. assumed for the past year that we did that, he assumed they were city volunteer. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't think we're opposed to agreeing. Yeah, we're not opposed to that. Right? <laughs> not opposed but to just so that you look into that part of it too, then on your yeah. long list of things to yeah. do. <laughs> that that, that, that there. seems like it would be a city, a city volunteer group. Yeah, yeah. Sponsor. I mean, like uh, warming center volunteers, mm -hmm. just like those who maybe volunteer at the garden. Yep. Right. So if you want to just I mean, we can put it under my, my committee. Sorry, what? We can maybe place them under my committee for the community services. So um, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's just like it's just like yeah. we have a work party one day 
to go clean up the community gardens, we'll sign waivers and you know, yeah. under the city's umbrella, be the same. But they need to be, you don't know what could happen. I mean, maybe you slip and fall, maybe somebody harms you, you need to have some type of backing up. Right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I did want to answer Don's question about funding. Uh, just signed a letter of support with the League of Oregon Cities and the Mayor's Association. They are lobbying the legislature for homeless funding. And if we get the amount they want, uh, the full amount would be $124,000 roughly per year to City Oak Ridge for those services. Good. Um, so that's not for this year, it may be past year, next year. Mm -hmm. So there may be some money coming for these type of services. And obviously they're asking for as much as possible. That's the high end. Fingers crossed. That's been a big topic for all cities. <laughs> all right. Anything more for this? Do you guys feel like kind of got what you needed? Maybe even better? Yeah, I feel good about that. Yeah. We've accomplished. Okay. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Okay. I think it's a good option. Thank all you right. very much. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for doing that. It's a big, big task. All right, next thing would be 9.4, uh, Sanitary Sewer Manhole Restoration Project Bid Reviewed by City Engineer Ed Postres. There he is. Hi, Ed. Hi, Hi Ms. Mayor. Hi, Councilors uh, in City of Oak Ridge. Um, appreciate you letting me chat with you a little bit tonight. I just briefly wanted to go over this project and, and the results of a recent bid that we had, which um, to get cut right to the chase, the, the results were excellent. Uh, this came out of, uh, I don't know the exact timing of the funding that was developed for this, but six months back or, or longer, I believe the city received some federal funds which were allocated for uh, I and I improvements, and therefore I was directed to come up with a scope of work with the Public Works Department, and then put it out to bid. And so what we're looking at doing is um, refurbishing a number of manholes that uh, have a significant amount of of I and I, which is basically infiltration and inflow. That's the the term I and I. So there's a lot of water comes into them, and this water then flows down to the treatment plant and causes significant damage over time to both the treatment plant and other um, sanitary system infrastructure. So we developed a list of the worst manholes and then I drew up a bid that took basically the 10 worst were what we call the basic bid. Whoever got the lowest price to do those would win the bid. And then after that, we had the 10 next worst to be done. That's that's called alternative, I, I think alternative A or alternative one in the bid schedule. So the bottom line is that um, I sent these proposals out per Oregon procurement law to uh, four or even five contractors. They're specialty contractors to do this work. Three responded. And the low bid, as you should see from your packet, was a, a company called Molecular Inc. And what they do is they install a system that's basically resin-based. It's, it's essentially a, a form made out of a, a very, very strong chemical resin that's first lowered into the manhole and then it's heated and it expands and seals the manhole and takes care of all the cracks um, in areas where water can come in. This is a very common technique in the industry and, and we've worked with this type of technique before. So that's why it was selected. Um, so their results for the base bid, if I have, and I apologize for looking at this, I think I have it on my phone. It was at, I've been on the road for two days, so I don't have the paperwork in, in front of me. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the base bid is $32,000. And that's for that first 10 manholes, the worst ones. And then if so, if the council so chooses, which I hope you do, 
we could go on to do uh, the next 10 manholes, uh, which uh, would was another bit of similar cost. And so it's about, that would be a little over 50,000, so approximately $53,000. And do you folks have any questions on that matter? Council, can you go ahead? I just have one. I remember when we did allocate the funds, um, may I be told that the, um, the area that really needed to be worked on was up the Meadowview or whatever it's called up by where um, Michelle lives. That away. That away, maybe. Is that what? Is that where you're talking about starting? Yes, absolutely. It, yeah, up at Elk Meadows and then okay. coming down Meadow Way, there's, I, I think Robert can confirm if it's, it's seven or eight manholes that just have a, a ton of water come in. And, and just by eliminating those seven, it, it, I think it's seven, will make a significant difference in inflow into the sanitary system. So yeah, long, Answer to a short question, absolutely. That's where we uh, chose, selected the manholes. Okay, thank you. I apologize if you already said that. I didn't get to that. No, no problem. I, I wasn't specific as to where they were. Okay. I have one question for you or him, either one. You guys are talking about actually disabling the manholes? No. Okay. No, they're, no. they're paired in place. Okay. While the sewer flows, uh, everything continues, and and if we have to bypass, mm -hmm. they put a pump in there. If they seal off the upstream, they'll pump it around. Uh, so okay. it's quite a process. But. Right. Okay. Because the way he was talking, that it expands, and I'm thinking, yeah, there goes all the water. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was rather unclear. It does not fill the manhole. It it just right. seals it. Yeah. Thank you. Any other, go ahead, Council Opinion. Um, when would the project be starting in the physical work? At, at this point, um, Molecular Inc. has indicated to me that they could get started as early as a week or so. And uh, this, as long as the there's not too much precipitation, this project can be done very rapidly. It just take a couple days. Oh. And can they work in the rain? Because we are predicted to start raining for about 10 days or more. Yeah, yeah yes, they can. And what, in the best case scenario, and, and this is just, this is your folks' decision. It's just something I'm gonna let, throw out our thinking to you is that we would do both the basic bid and the alternative this fall you know, depending on the weather. I'm assuming that it's just, you know, we're gonna go into the wet season, we'll, we'll get some clear periods, but it's just gonna get wetter and wetter. And then doing those, if, if we can have access to additional funds, which I believe there are for this, again, that's entirely up to you guys. We would evaluate again during the winter where the next set of, you know, uh, manholes that are causing problems are, and we, and we already have some, especially Robert, has some very good ideas of, of where those would be. And then we come back in the spring and, and do another round. Okay, and that whole, that project would be bid separately from this one? That project would be done by the same contractor utilizing these prices. Oh, the same bid would apply. Yep, yep. So right now though, we're only approving one. Is that what we're doing or? That's, that's all I was aware of. I, I didn't know it was gonna double. Okay. Um, well, there, it's all my understanding was there's there's 100,000 in the funds. Yeah. There's only 50,000, which leaves an additional 50,000 left over roughly to do more work of the same mm -hmm. type of work. Right. But to clarify, this bid is for thirty-two thousand. But there's also, I'm guessing, um, the other twenty-one thousand is potential at additional costs that just aren't for sure yet. Well, the additional costs are for sure, 
what what we would recommend is that you approve both you know the basic bid the, the award to the low bidder and then also approve the alternative and because they're, it's an excellent price for both and, and we would do those and then we would come back to you and say this is what we'd like to do again you know further with the remaining funds okay does everyone understand that yeah I think I need a little more information on the alternative. Oh, it's all right here, Bobby. Yeah, um, that's all that's yes, there. Yeah. It, it breaks it down right here. Yeah. I read that earlier. Okay, so I understood it right I have one, one question, which mm -hmm. is of an ignorant question, but I'm not familiar with this stuff. So we approve, if we approve the 50,000 say, then you fix all of these, then there's another 50,000 in there. Is there something else that we could use that for besides manhole covers or I mean manholes or that type of thing with I and I? There's lots of different things you could use that funds for, for I and I. Um, yeah, that, there, that's a great question. <laughs> but is there other things that would be needing quicker fix or more attention that that could be used for? Because we're not going to have that next year. You know, I mean, that type of stuff is not going to be. Right. The, the, the reason of choosing the manholes first is because it's the easiest to tell where your where your water's coming in. Mm -hmm. your, I, your I and I is coming in. You can okay. actually see it. Now checking inside the actual pipes, you have to run a TV camera right. down the yeah. leaks. And to do that, you're going to spend a lot of money just researching, trying to find the locations of the I and I. And then once you find them, then you have a complete different type of uh, ceiling mechanism to yep. to clear those off, which is far more spendy. So so utilizing this and, and getting the manholes addressed first. Uh, by just doing these, we're figuring roughly uh, two to three hundred gallons a minute of inflow that will not be going to the treatment plant just by doing these. Oh, okay. Yeah, that Robert just summed it up excellently, and but that's a great question. Yeah, the bottom line is the 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 manholes are really the low hanging fruit of your problems out there. So that this is the best way to attack it you start to look at the pipes and other parts of the infrastructure, the cost becomes significantly higher. Instead of wanting 50,000, we would need 500,000. So we're we're trying to get the biggest, obviously get the biggest bang for the buck here. Okay. The other part is, or the other question, if there's a delay in traffic or a disruption of traffic and that type of stuff, how long would that be for? Minutes. Okay. They have yeah. But yeah. I, but yeah, very short. Okay. Because I don't want my mail late. Oh, don't, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> It'll be there. I couldn't resist. <laughs> um, <laughs> anybody else have anything else? Do we need any other council? Council Bjornson, if you have any questions. <laughs> No questions from me. I'll call for a question. Do we have a recommended on the table? Yes, the recommended mm -hmm. motion at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Oh, it hasn't. It's not on the table yet. Mm -hmm. no. Okay. Um, I move to award the sanitary sewer manhole restoration project. To Molecular Incorporated for, I'm going to change the motion, sorry. Is this what you're looking for? 53,500. Thank you, Bucky. <laughs> uh, as detailed in their bid and City Engineer Hodges' memo. I'll second. Motion made by Councillor Kenyon and seconded by Councillor Whitney. Any more discussion? Councillor Whitney? Aye. Councillor Cooper? Aye. Councillor Bjornsson? 
Aye. Governor Hallett? Aye. Councilor Hooker? Aye. Councilor Dingen? Aye. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Appreciate that. Oh, you are absolutely welcome. All right, next item up is 9.5 Hill Street turnaround uh, with proposal from Kelly and, Kelly and Damian Brewer. Did you have something? Did you want to read this first or not? Uh, I, don't, I didn't print out the picture. Okay. I didn't print out the picture, but I figured if the picture will be put out. Yeah, fine. I didn't. Since we get some background on this issue, hopefully council's had a chance to read my summary. This has been an ongoing issue for a while now. Um, sometimes the issues have changed uh, a little bit, but I know it's it's been a, a headache for everybody involved. Um, but that's why I brought it to council is to hopefully get some final resolution at least direction uh, so we can put this to bed as they say uh, anyway I, I try to be neutral in my narrative description I think neither side of the issue was happy with the way I described it you know that there's everybody wanted a little bit more here and there but I tried to keep it brief but I wanted to give um, people a chance to express this to council. And I know a lot of councilors are already aware because they didn't succeed on some emails and, and whatnot. So there's some background. Um, so I wanted to give uh, Kelly Brewer a chance to um, explain uh, her side and, and her ideas for resolution. And then give uh, the city a uh, chance to respond to city engineer Hodges and uh, Robert Christman Public Works. Oh, would you like go ahead, Councillor? Um, before we go there, I'm wondering if you could explain to us, James, if you offered a solution to Miss Brewer. If so, because um, I didn't, I didn't see one. I mean, it might be that just came the words, but yeah. And then, and then, did she disagree with the solution, and now is asking us to? Um, do something other than what you've decided already? Yes, that, that's accurate. If, if I had written everything that has happened, well, it goes back to three more city administrators, but sure. um, since I became involved, uh, blockades, cement blockades were, were set up at, at one point to protect the well field. It, it closed off the turnaround that citizens had been using for years and years. Um, but, was, but was that your direction? Yeah, your so solution? yeah. So my solution at, at one point was to move those barriers back a bit so that fire trucks could still turn around, large trucks could turn around. That would that I, we attempted that solution didn't work out because the system still wanted to be able to use the entire turnaround, not just a little pull out. Is that a fair description of that? They moved the block back eight feet. <laughs> that was the solution because the fire truck was was out and it needed like a seven point turn to turn around so they moved it back eight feet which didn't do anything for the citizens on hill street so since march of this year um, i have had quite a bit of experience and uh, research that i've put into this whole thing um, i wrote up something that I'm willing to read or I can leave for you guys to read later. Um, it basically gives you a, an idea of the timeline of what we've gone through with public works going above and beyond to close off this area unnecessarily. Um, the, this all started back in March of this year. Um, we, had a, we had years worth of police calls um, in regards to the Rainbow Ranch, which is located, which was located beyond the Jasper uh, Street train trestle. Um, we advocated with Val Miller and James to um, have that area blocked off with rocks to stop the through traffic. The people would come in there and they would go back to the Rainbow Ranch. And then when police were called, they would all file out on First Street, making policing that area impossible. 
when you say come through there, do you mean with vehicles? Yeah. Not, but, yeah. Okay. Um, with vehicles, it, night and day, all day traffic. Are talking about the moon ranch? Mm -hmm. Moon ranch. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm I always, making sure we all know. Yeah. yeah. There's a few different names for it. Yeah. I've always heard Rainbow Ranch. So. With this, um, Mr. Christman was asked to place boulders at the uh, train railroad trestle. Um, without any direction from the current CA, he decided to go up and block off various entrances up and down Hill Street all the way to the hatchery. But he left a whole bunch of them going down our street. But the first one he blocked off was the turnaround. And he was claiming that it was to block off through traffic. We confronted what's going on. Oh, I need to block this off. We can't have through traffic. This is not a solution. There's a hundred other ways to access the levy from Hill Street all the way to 58. So then once we started advocating with Councillor Coker, Mayor Hollett, we called Scott out, we called James out, the whole nine yards. Nobody could understand why this whole area needed to be blocked off. Then it was because it wasn't the through traffic anymore. Then it became the, the shut off cap that's parked right there. If you look at your pictures, I brought the current pictures of what the turnaround looks like right now. That giant dump truck is now sitting on top of the cap that was not supposed to be driven over. Um, we had a boulder place there that was supposed to alleviate that problem. That wasn't good enough. Now it's the well field needing to be protected. So I had to go through months and research and calling people and trying to figure out what exactly is it that is trying to be blocked off here? Why? Why, why, why? Robert told my husband at the very beginning, if you move these logs, it becomes personal. Well, our whole neighborhood with having months and months of getting nowhere with finding out why this is being blocked off, just the neighborhood needed that area. So the neighbors moved the logs. Then it became a war. Then Robert decided every time he saw it oh, close. I'm sorry, I need to interject. So go ahead. Um, I know that you have a personal dispute with an employee, mm -hmm. but I think in this forum, we don't talk negatively about employees. Okay. This is not the place to talk about that. Okay. You will take that directly with change. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Okay. So with, with that, we were told that it was now personal and it continued on and on and on. We did multiple rounds with CAs trying to find out what's going on. Why is this so important to be shut off? We were told that it's always been closed, but I've lived there for 17 years. I have a signed form here for someone that's lived there for 40 years. That area has never been closed off, not ever. It's always been an open field that the residents of Hill Street were able to use. No easement, no blocking, wide open. So with that, Quick question. Sorry to interrupt. Mm -hmm, you're fine. Are you aware of uh, the property that you're speaking of? Is it all city property or is it? Yeah, it's city public or... land. Okay. Yeah. Just yeah. want to clarify. Yeah, that. of course. So um, after lots and lots of research, um, calling OHA, LCOG, the whole nine yards, I paid the $48 public um a fee to have public records released and I got the city of Oak Ridge drinking water protection plan. It said nothing in there about easements, nothing. It wasn't until I pulled the Oregon state drinking water protection plan that I learned about easements with water easements with well fields. So then it became, okay, how can we have a solution to this problem with allowing for that easement? So then my son and I went out with a hundred foot measuring tape and we measured out 100 feet around the, around the well field, out from the well field. And as you can see, the narrowest point on that leftover field is 50 feet, and the length of it is over 100 feet, which is plenty of room to continue allow vehicles to, for our vehicles to pull in there to turn around and continue on down the road. But when I started looking around our community, I went down to just the other side of Salmon Creek Park. And I found where the city building has two more well fields. And as you can see right here, this is, it's an unnamed road. The locals call it the community garden road. It goes along Salmon Creek Park and makes a sharp left. There's multiple houses back there. It comes within 30 feet of that wellhead right there. 
This it's, well, if I'm not mistaken, went in in 1965. I have the well drilling thing right here. That talks can I about see, I'm sorry, <laughs> can I see which picture you're referring to, please, Kelly? Yes, I don't know if you can see it from here. Yeah. It's just yeah, I've gone through the ones in the emails and the, I'm sorry, the council packet. I just wanted to know which one you were talking about. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think you got these. Um, it's basically just on the other side of the oh, industrial center. Yeah, I, I, those, said that I, I did send them. Those were, did. we did get oh, those, yeah. Um, so with this, I noticed that this well field only has like a 30 foot easement and it's right on a main thoroughfare. These people have to access this road and drive back there to get to their homes. It goes to the community garden and it also goes to a whole bunch of houses on Hill Street that have backyard access. They use that road and it's used, in my opinion, far more than just a simple turnaround. This is a, a very small area. There's only about a third of it that's within the easement that we would pull in right here turn around this little turn right here and exit where that dump truck is. It was a simple way. Nobody pulls onto the well field. Nobody pulls out here, just simple turnaround. And in the very beginning of all this, my husband and I own a construction company and we offered to build free of charge a split rail fence on the outside of the turnaround, allowing mail, fire, police, FedEx, delivery vehicles, UPS, all the people on our, that visit our street that need a place to turn around it allowed that without allowing people to drive through to the levee, which was originally the issue that was at hand. But since then, because it's a constant issue, the reasons have changed. The thoroughfare, and it was the cap, and now it's the well field. So all these things have been discounted and the fact that we can't have one well field that's having everyone up in arms because of the lack of easement when we've got this well field with hardly any easement at all. Kelly, I have a question. Sure. Is this, I'm not quite sure where this is. Is this the road that goes, the dirt road that yeah. goes out and okay. goes like in behind where Mr. DeVries lives and yes. goes out onto Y Drive? There's, that's where it is. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. That is. So it is. It's the one that comes out onto Y Drive. Right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, may I ask mm -hmm. you a quick question? Sure. When you proposed the, uh, split rail fence idea, what was the answer that you got? We had to look in, if I'm not mistaken, they had to look more into it. And then months went by with no with no answers. So again, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So uh, yes, we did look into that issue. The, the issue is the 100 foot law, at, at least half of the existing turnaround is within the 100 feet, it's about 80, 88 feet. So it's, it's just barely, but. If you look at the pictures, you can see right where those cones are. It's only the first like eight feet of the entrance of the turnaround. Those candlesticks where that hundred foot is, it comes to like right here. So this whole area is open. Right, but we would have to cut down that tree in order for a, a car to pass yes. on the if right you, side. If you absolutely stuck to the hundred foot easement, Unlike this one, you would absolutely have to cut short this turnaround. I, I just want to answer the yes. question about did we absolutely. consider that? Yes, we did. We found it could because of the hundred feet. And there's a, there's additional issue on the other side of the pipe that runs underneath. We just had a, a, the same style pipe, ten inch pipe, burst at the OIP. We lost over a million gallons of water. Big crisis. I'll let the engineer and, and, and Robert talk about that later, but just to answer your question, yeah, we did consider that and it was a generous offer to do the split rail fence. But... This is a picture of the new shutoff caps that were just placed in the center of Jasper Street, the ones that are supposedly not able to be driven over right in the middle of the street. Three of them. Go ahead, Bobby. Who installed that? Actually, <clears throat> I'm not sure. You know who installed these? I know Public Works was out there a lot. No, was it city or county? I'm not sure. It was a contractor. Okay. Go ahead, Councilor Yarnson. 
Yeah, this turnaround area at any time, is it ever used for parking vehicles or large rigs, trailers, anything like that? Never. Or is it solely used as a pass through? It's simply by the neighborhood. It's never once. We were very protective over our street, and that's something that has never ever once come up. It's always just been a pass through. Okay, thank you. What about when it was being worked on? Can you say there was heavy equipment? Yeah, when uh, seven years. or so years ago, when that pipeline went in under the levee, um, there was a, that construction went on for like a year and there was a whole bunch of heavy equipment. That's how it originally got rubbed down. Before that, it was just an open field. There was grass and brush, but it was always open for residents and visitors of Hill Street to turn around. It's always just been open, but it actually got rubbed down when the heavy equipment was in there constantly using it. Councilor Whitney. So um, this question isn't for Kelly. So uh, what I would really like to hear about um, specifically are the two wells, um, how much both of them produce kind of where they are in location on the map. So, cause I can kind of visualize where the one is um, and get more details because I think it's important to know um, the water output for the two wells and what they produce and how important they are to the city and um, really to hear from Ed Hodges about his concerns um, you know, regarding safe drinking water. And I know, yeah, so I saw, I saw this, but I just really wanna hear a little more details about those wells, um, you know, any implications that we may have and then um, get more information on when this turnaround really became a turnaround. Um, I think that's important because if it's just been more recent than I think it's just not an established turnaround. It really should have be. It's been there in the last 11 years that I've delivered map. 11? Yes. Yeah, it's been there for the 17 years. The 11 that I know of. Well, I think it would be great to get a little more information. I know Google Maps should be able to provide more clarity on that. Um, and then also, once I hear more about that, I think, well, I'll, I'll save it till you hear do you want to go first or do you want to let it go? I just want to quickly verify, Kelly, were you done with your presentation before um, we move on to? More or less, yeah. I just was going to mention, you know, the small things like the fact that it's never been closed. It's being stated that it's only been there for seven years. But again, that was how long ago it got rubbed down to the point where it was just dirt. Prior to that, it was just, you know, I have, my son is 14 and I have pictures of him playing in that field when he was a baby and there's nothing. <laughs> so it's been open for a really long time and now suddenly decades later it needs to be closed it's just something it, it feels like there's this isn't just about wealthy age because I'm I have just as much concern for our drinking water and that's why I took the time to go through and measure out the easement and everything to, to show the council that even if we give that 100 foot easement to the well there's still lots of area it's all being bombarded with boulders that have been staged there yesterday and today now, but that area is all very large and open and it can make for a perfect T turnaround and not in, in fringe on the easement at all. Thank you. I think we're gonna mm -hmm. now move into what Bob was asking that would be the engineer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you a were you able to hear some of the things that Councillor Whitney mentioned? Yeah, no, I, I think I did. And I also heard the citizens' concerns and, and very interesting to hear a point of view. And so if you if all you folks wouldn't mind, the first thing I'd like to do is just sort of give some general information about the situation and then kind of walk through it. And just to provide you with, with basically the facts on the matter, not necessarily to some of the disputes or other items, but what, what the situation is. So let me start off with just a little description of the wellhead protection area, um, which is you know already been discussed somewhat. But the bottom line is that federal and state law for any municipal water source that's of, of a well type require now what's what's called a wellhead protection area. And it's basically a circle with a 100 foot radius or 200 foot diameter. It's almost an acre of land, which the well is at the center. 
And the two major caveats of the wellhead protection area are, one is that the control of the land is by one entity and it, it either needs to be the municipality or some other entity that has complete control over it so that they can control any of the activities that are on it. Okay, that's number one. Number two is the activities that are allowed within the wellhead protection area are very limited. And where it really breaks down, this is now a question of a right-of-way activity within the wellhead area. And so this breaks down into what type of aquifer you have. There are two principal types of aquifer. If you have what's called a confined aquifer, what that means is that you've got your well and you drill down through the soil and there's some sort of naturally impermeable layer that, that protects the layer below where the groundwater is contained. And this is, this is a very common phenomenon, especially in the Midwest and some other states. And, and these are very good aquifers in terms of being not very sensitive to contamination that could come from above, you know, say a surface spill or something and get into the aquifer, right? So again, that's the confined aquifer. The next type of aquifer is an unconfined. And essentially that's just what we have in Oak Ridge. It's, it's this permeable soil that's composed of cobbles and rocks and gravel and a little sand and silt mixed together. And in general, these aquifers are very susceptible to contamination that comes from above. If there's some type of chemical or liquid that gets you know, gets into the soil, it will work its way straight into the groundwater bearing part of the aquifer and, you know, cause problems. The law is very clear that right-of-ways are allowed or right-of-way use where there is a confined aquifer present for the well. They are not allowed for when you have an unconfined aquifer for the situation in Oak Ridge. So really the point is that the law just simply states that there cannot be any activities that involve right away driving, et cetera, within a hundred feet of any well that at this time. Mayor. Okay, so is that absolutely clear or clear at all? Wanna ask now or wait? Yeah, they are. <laughs> uh, Ed, can you hold up for one minute? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so Ed, I know that you've stated in your email that the one well that's in question near the area she's at is an unconfined well. But yes. What about the rest of all of our wells in Oak Ridge? All of the wells are in are unconfined or in what what's called an unconfined aquifer. Okay. And the the at the the issue with the aquifer at in Oak Ridge is the soil is highly permeable. It, it's some of the most permeable soil I've ever seen in my career. And, and I've done a lot with wells over that career and you know, have some knowledge of it. it it's, you know, you could, you could literally stand in the well field and pour you know, a gallon of some substance onto the soil. And it's particularly when there's uh, precipitation, it's gonna infiltrate rapidly and make its way into the groundwater aquifer. Uh, and it's not just me that thinks this, there's been a couple of studies of aquifer, of, excuse me, Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge water system aquifer. And in particular, there's a study in 1994, which was done by Oregon Health Department that stated that Oak Ridge had, you know, the highest level of sensitivity and risk of contamination coming in from above and, and impacting the aquifer. Okay, so that's, that's basically some of the background on this. Now, the, what the, um, the citizen has pointed out is absolutely correct about the other two wells though, because right now near your house, we're obviously talking about well number six, but you're absolutely correct about wells number one and two. And as you stated correctly, well, well number two in particular was, is, is the same age as me. It's 57 years old. Well, number one, I can't, Robert, is that well older? Or is it, I know it's the same time or older, right? It's roughly the same time. That's what I thought. I thought they were drilled almost in the same year. 
the issue there is that at that time in 1965, the, the knowledge and understanding of this, the mechanism of how an unconfined aquifer can get contaminated was not as, as good as it is today. So there was a, there was a sanitary radius or, or the wellhead protection area required then, but it was at most 50 feet. So it would have been half of what it is today or even less in some cases. It might've even been 25 feet at that time. So it, it's absolutely correct to look at those two wells and say, you know, what's going on here? I mean, you've got activities that really are, are not, you know, good for risk that are occurring there. The principal reason is just that, you know, unfortunately those wells were installed a long time ago. Those roads may have already been there or not. There may be some method today of controlling the access, which I would recommend, but be that as it may, when you move back to well number six, which it seems like where most of the issue is, it's just rock solid that you can't do anything within a hundred feet of the well, that's by law. And then just my recommendation as your engineer is that unfortunately, you, you know, you have a great water source, but it is very susceptible to contamination. And I think folks, you know, particularly on council and also citizens are aware that there already are some issues with chemical contamination of water in Oak Ridge. And so therefore, you know, even if there's, even a minute risk is added by doing activity you know, my feeling is I really recommend that you don't want to do that. But, but you know, I'm not talking about anything beyond 100 feet. I'm just sticking to the law, you know, and the requirements at this time. Go ahead. Go ahead. Kelly, could you show us that picture again of Jasper? Sure. And then, Ed, I want to ask you a question regarding yeah. that. Yeah, can you just put oh. it to where you can see it? So that right there, are those confined or unconfined? Or are yeah. those in wellheads? They're wellheads. They're not, they're, they're shut off caps. Yeah, they're not, they're shut off caps, not. Yes, well. are you talking about these? But they're similar, no, they're similar about to, the, the, to the cap. You know, I, I can't see, I apologize. I, I just can't see it at all, even when it's close. I'm, let me let me try, and I'll make absolutely clear when, but, oh, go ahead. What I'm trying to get at is she had made a point that those are driven over all the time. And the one by, at, by wall six, is being blocked and stopped from being driven over. So what Robert, I'm asking is what can, is the difference? Well, actually, Robert, can you, what are those? What are we discussing there? They're discussing the, the valve boxes. Oh, okay. That valve uh, I'm protecting there is the, the 10 inch that was uh, installed that goes across the river. It is one of the most critical valves to make sure that it does not get destroyed in any way because if that line breaks in between that valve and the other side of the river to the booster station, we're gonna lose a million gallons of water again, plus whatever the well capacities are gonna push out, which is roughly 1400 gallons. So it's not that it can't be driven over. I never said that, it just needs to be protected. So it can be controlled. That's all I think. And how do you protect okay. this one? That's good to know, thank you, Robert. They're designed to be drove over. I just want to make sure that that one isn't drove over. The water line that just broke up at the industrial park was designed to be drove over, but it broke because it got drove over. Mm -hmm. And that was a 5,000 gall gallon a minute leak that ended up draining almost full risk. So Robert, so, is the one by well six smaller than these ones? No, it's or the same it's size. But the problem with that is the, the water line is only about 22 inches deep which means the top of that valve head is very shallow. So the sudden impact of the, of the constant rigs going over the top of it because it's so shallow makes it extremely vulnerable. Okay, thank you. Um, quick question is right now, you say that that's used for like fire engines and delivery it trucks has and, been, yeah. and you guys yeah. for residents. Mm -hmm. Is it constantly used? No, it's just it's just when needed. It's right. like okay. mail would come through, they would they would redirect um, garbage recycling. Right. It was um, when FedEx would come through. You okay. know, as of right now, FedEx pulls all the way into my driveway at the end of the street and then does 
a 72 point turn to redirect right. because with all the neighbors parking their cars there, there's simply just not enough room. And that shut off valve that he's talking about was had a boulder placed there. And it's since been moved. And I have a video of the excavator that he was using to pound the K rails into this area right. and the rock right on top of that cap. So I guess I'm not really convinced that it's as delicate as it's being said, because not only are these other ones made to be driven over, and I understand, again, I don't want to have any risk to our water. That is not why I'm here. I am simply stating that this, this is an absolute crazy situation that did not need to come to this. It simply could have been discussed and investigated and had a solution that was reasonable, but instead it was, no, we're closing it off. Nope, that's it. We're closing off all the way down the levee. We're closing all the way down here and all the way down there. We're just closing everything off. Nobody gets to come in. Okay. And for us living there for as long as we have, they've right. cut us off at the end of our street. We have a very long street right. and there's no way to get down with any type of a trailer. My husband and I own a construction company. He's had to back down from Salmon Creek Park. Right. And We've a, driven down that yes, way. And it's, a very, so. it's a very long street and we need some kind of a turnaround. And no matter what I brought to the table as a solution, it was cut down because Mr. Christman felt like this whole well field, right. the whole so area. Again, I, it, we're well, not I know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's, I, I, I'm, I'm sure just going to interrupt because I feel like that's a rule for council. That's that all. The public has the right to Yeah, talk. absolutely. So, John, I agree. But, but it's not our not job. That's actually James's job. If James yes. has a problem, that's James's job, not okay. ours. So, okay. James, just so you know, if you feel that a community member is attacking your employee, that is absolutely. actually your responsibility. If you feel that way or if your employee feels that way. I think. Okay. She's keeping it factual. She's just saying yeah. that. It's been my only point of contact has been the CA who has been corresponding with Mr. Christman. That's those that Mr. Christman was in was the one laying down the law of what was happening. And the CA was just all three of them have been trying to figure out why. But again, since the very beginning, the, the reasons have changed. First, it was the levy. Then it was the cap. And now it's the well field. It wasn't the well field in the beginning. It was the it was the traffic. It was the people going back to the Moon Ranch when we cut off that railroad trestle. It stopped. Then the, the ranch sold. Now we don't have any more traffic on that levee. Every once in a while, we'll have teenage kids on a quad. Good luck stopping that. <laughs> but other than that, we have no more trying traffic through there unless it's on foot. And again, good luck stopping that too. So I'm. Again, I have, I'm, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. This has been a very disrespectful ordeal. It has been, it has been a nonstop headache. It's been a constant back and forth of just testosterone. Poor James has got thrust into the middle of it the day he started, because by then I was five months into this fight. And it's literally our well-being at the end of our street. Mr. Chrisman cut down, cut off the levee all the way to the hatchery. And we were in level three evacuation, and there was there's no way for fire trucks to get back there underneath the uh, the railroad trestles blocked off, and all the levee access all the way down. There would be no way for them to get back there. So let me finish my question. Mm -hmm. Is so it's a turnaround basically is all it is. Yeah. I mean that's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Can I? I no, okay. I have already seen it. The only thing, the reason I say no is because I want to get my question out there. Okay. The question is, I've seen the dump truck there. I've seen the excavator or whatever it's called. Um, it's parked there. They've been parked there. You guys use it as a turnaround or to go, you know, do stuff like when you take the, the uh, truck out. You got to use that to get around. So if you move the truck that's there now or was there the other day, what's the difference of when you're parked there with machinery or you use it for something or the boulders are put there? If somebody just goes down, the trucks be, you know, I mean, it's not like 100 ton trucks that are going on it. Um, 
I guess my question is, what's the difference if, say, a delivery van uses it or a mail truck or something like that, where you guys are already parking stuff in that area? You know what I mean? I mean, I do you understand? understand okay. So now you can answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, the, the sole source of this is I, I never did want to isolate them completely. Mm -hmm. I was always open to an alternative, always have been. But when it became an argument, I had to back away because it became personal. Damien and I couldn't get along. I backed away and left it up to the, to the boss. Since then, I've always told them that I'm always open for alternative, but the well field needs to be protected. So, so what would your alternative be? There's, well, Hill Street goes well beyond uh, the corner of their property, and we've already drawn a picture of where we could ultimately put a turnout. But if you see this red line, that's the valve that we're protecting. Right. That water line comes at a 45 for about eight feet, and then it goes about 80 feet down the slope to where it then makes another turn and goes and then crosses the river. Mm -hmm. The alternative turnaround would be roughly, this is the alleyway, would be splitting that as long as we don't cover the pipe, because if that is covered with more material, right. then it's going to be harder for me to make that repair if it does break. Right. And it's not if, it's when water pipes break. We've been on a water leak today. Are you showing up to that red line there? Is that what you're talking about? This here? Is the yeah. red line the 100 foot? No, this is just where the actual water line is oh, right now. Okay. That, the red line is the water line. Gotcha. And where's so, the well? The, the well that's in question? It's way... Yeah, it's way, way back. Way. It's back over here. Right. So where's the so house? Where's the hundred feet? Well, her house is right, right, right there. And, and so the alternative, so it will protect the well field. Uh -huh. And the well field is, is basically, it covers wells two, one, two, four, and six, including okay. all five inches on in there. So it's in the entire field, the entire property is all well. Okay. That's the entire So you're the so you protect. It's just We're moving it down. Yeah, just moving it down in, in front of the house, splitting the gap where this alleyway goes through uh -huh. so they could easily make a turnaround there. And I don't have a problem with it. Where's the 100 fit right now? It's not, it's not on, it's not on that one because that's over farther. Where's the current turnaround there? Is it over here or over here? Right here is where they come um, Right. It's, it's, it's back right farther. Here. And then the well is roughly here. So, and the 100 foot comes okay. through over here. So we're extending it over. I just don't want them to be over the top of the, of the, the existing water line. Again, like I said, I've never, never, did not want an alternative. I did not want to isolate this completely. I was asked to do something and I'm asked to protect the city's drinking water program um, during the uh, public safety and health is the number one priority. And that's all I was doing. Right, which is what she wants done as well. Right. And, and again, I wasn't, I'm not trying to make enemies. I'm not trying to do anything illegal, unethical or immoral. I'm just doing my job to protect the city's assets. So I guess my my other question would be, what was wrong with that proposal? That was never proposed. Um, first okay. of all, I haven't heard hide nor hair from Mr. Christman at all, other than just replacing everything that is right. there okay. now and upping the ante each time. Um, but from my perspective, you're talking about the easement that goes between my house and Mr. and Mrs. Lindy, right? That would be a, uh, the, the a portion. Yeah, that that is a utility easement that yes. goes through there. There's also a fire hydrant right there. Right. Okay. How do you propose getting around this number one? That's Ivan and Debbie's driveway, and then you have the easement, and then right on the corner, that's on where my property starts and theirs ends. It's like maybe ten feet across, and there's a fire hydrant right here. So how do you make a turnaround in that area? Maybe go down and shore that. What you I know what he's talking about. And to about. clarify, it's not an easement to ride away between the houses. Well, it's all filled with grass, and it's not right. It's un yeah, un unused it for is, traffic, but yeah. it is a right of way. It's not an easement. Okay. 
is uh is what your the gray line kind of down to here is this the street? Oh yeah, yeah. This is the street and the street goes yeah. from there really close to the front yards. This is the street that goes all the way down past Kelly's residence. So he's not talking about the in between your two houses. He's talking about across, across the, street the street from your house. It's across the street. Where the dump truck is? Or are you talking about the drag creek that dump truck? Right. So the dump truck right now is parked right here. Mm -hmm. We're proposing you can use all this area. Right Sorry. That's okay. So dump trucks right here on yep. this side, right? The, the, oh, the, there it is. Right there. It's I the see the That's where the water valve is. Okay, and then this would be the entrance to the dry creek bed here, right? That's where it drops off. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Is that would that be able to be brought up to make it usable? Because right now it is just it's like good. it's a huge, huge. It, it goes down. down. It goes down like 25, 30 feet. I got My kids right call it the hey. <laughs> It it goes. It's yeah, down. it's way so, down. You're talking about removing trees. No, I'm, no, there's the, no. The city, the city is proposing to let them use it. The city is not proposing oh to do God. any of the work. The city doesn't have the funds to do this type of thing right now. So if they want to utilize this, they can. They just need to to build it. I was going to say can, if they still would agree to do that themselves, would. There's, they be able to yeah absolutely and there's and you can also uh create an lid where you get the rest of the people who live on the street involved if they want to pitch in uh to fund this it's, okay. it's yeah. something that, that can easily be done is it robert where it dips down and yeah. it goes down is that mm -hmm. what we're talking it, about it, yeah it could even be moved so, further that way but it's not recommended right. so one of the advantages of this proposal is that retains everything is being done in the right of way with absolutely nothing going into the well field at that with that policy. So it keeps the well field safe. It keeps, it keeps, it keeps, it keeps, it keeps it everybody off of it. But this dip but is just in the well field. About... The dip is in the well field. Right. Oh, so it, it is a, past the dip, then is it's what you're saying. West of the dip mm -hmm. and north. So yes. it's so it wouldn't street, even entail the dip. There no, is, this, this there is a in... large, there's a telephone pole or a power pole right there. There's a large hill of dirt. There's like 15 feet. And then there's like the dump truck and then the center of the turnaround. So my proposal was also the fact that with a hundred foot easement around the well, which you can use all those boulders to block it off without having to bring up a dip or going into floodplain or anything like that, we can still have all the area that I marked <laughs> out in that easement or outside of that easement, it leaves a perfectly reasonable I'm not an area right on right alongside of the well. It goes alongside where the blackberries are up to the levee and around. There's plenty of room. There's no dirt that needs to be brought up to bring it above the floodplain. There's no work to be done other than to move the boulders. So what that's I my think it goes over the pipe. Other than it goes you you be but if we if we if we talked about all the pipes we drive over it's, all throughout the city, you're absolutely correct, Kelly. So I mean, it seems kind of silly to to, to this, worry about driving over a pipe when again there's just there's pipes everywhere. Right. But is this the only one that affects the drinking water? I, I know this, this, can't is, imagine. this is the it's one right. and only line that it's, feeds the industrial part. And That's the what it yeah. Is. Can I can I just just make one comment. Um, you're absolutely right. You know, buried pipes are in all roads, traveled ways, and and everything's fine. This piping system, unfortunately, right in that area, not through any intent on the cities, is somewhat unique in that it's it's totally focused on getting water to the boring under the river, and and that is a very specialized part of the water system that we really don't want people anywhere near driving, you know, in the valves. If something went wrong, uh, the cost to repair truck. would be extraordinary. You know, uh, there would, and there would also be the pressures there are, are extremely high. So you could be faced with, you know, fairly catastrophic events like blowing a hole in the levee and the like. So that's why, you know, just to give you some idea of where Robert's trepidation is coming from, it, it is 
in its own way, a little bit more special than many of the other, almost all of the other pipes in the city. I understand. I guess my question is what makes the city exempt from having these catastrophic things happen? The city, that, that's a really good point. And, and the bottom line I would tell you is the city is aware of the hazards, particularly the public works crew, and they work around them all the time. And so, you know, there, there is going to be some cases where they are going to have a moving vehicle, but they're absolutely aware, like someone who comes in in a turnaround, where one of these valve cans, that's what they're called is at night and doesn't know it's there and has a heavy truck and drives the, the valve can into the main and breaks it. You know, they, they, it's not that they're doing anything deliberately. They just don't know it's there. The city does, and they're going to, to the best of their abilities, avoid causing a problem. But they parked knowing you, that giant dump trucks and excavators and city vehicles. These vehicles are parked there on that area all the time. Every time there's weed whacking, every time there's any work to be done, they enter at the turnaround and they park right there. And that dump truck's been there for over a month. So I feel like it must not be that special if this is the case. Well, just a point of clarification, the, the dump truck is parked there to protect that. I protect, understand. That's why. And it's not, on, it's not on the valve. It's on the line though. It's not on the valve. Yeah, I believe it's just to protect the valve, right, Robert? Driving off right. the line. Yeah, it's on the line. It's no, I, don't want, I don't want more construction on the line, adding more dirt to the area. That's, yep. why, that's why I proposed the location. Okay. So we can avoid keeping everything and everybody off of the water line, off of the water valve, and out of the city's world. It has nothing to do with, with the fact that there are equipment on there and that there will be more equipment on there. The reason why we got those the rocks is because they were free. Forty thousand dollars worth of rock, and that levy is going to fail it. So I've been. Place that still rocks. I've looked at this turnaround. I just drew a half circle on there. Can we change it to where the half circle is a little bit tighter circle to where it's on the other side of the pipe? So I kind of drew the picture. So over where this the so other side, just a, here, right? Yes, yeah, so if we could tighten up yeah. that circle a little bit and put the pipe on the other side, Wait. so that there's a fence on the other side of the pipe, the valve cover. I'm sorry, the valve. I'm using that terminology. So, so we right tighten up that. Here you'll be within the within the hundred foot. Yeah, that's the problem. Oh. We need to move them. We need to move them closer. To so the you're end. not within the hundred foot in that way. Yes, it's your your out of the 100 foot and you're not even in the wellfield property. This white line right here is oh. all wellfield property. Gotcha. Okay. Never mind then. Go ahead, guys. Bobby, you were first. Um, so what I'm hearing, what through all of this conversation, the big thing, the big takeaways that I have from it is, you know, we have our engineer with recommendation. We have an alternate solution from Robert. We have Kelly's concerns and um, you know, we have some history and we have some conflicts around this. Um, and it sounds like everybody's trying to come to a consensus and find a solution that works well, but I don't think we as a group tonight are the right channel to really make all the decisions. And I think, I feel like, um, sorry, I feel like it would be um, a really good idea since we have a community services director that has history and um, knowledge and background and training in a lot of this area. Um, maybe take it back and let Rick, who's not been in any of the personal components of this, and there's no um, none of the, the conflicts in it, to help find a solution and bring us back a solution that would um, really work for all parties. Okay. I'm hesitant with that, but this is what myself and the previous two CAs have tried to do over the last year plus. So I, I understand kicking back, it, it's yeah. basically just kicking back to me. And <laughs> yeah. uh, I was thinking about trying to get Rick. Well, right, know, but, but it's that's ultimately, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's the first time it's come to us and. Honestly, when I received the packet, it was the first time I heard about it. So, um, you know, I just, I just don't think that we can find all the solutions in this 
meeting because I think I feel like um, there's just a lot of pieces that we've all discussed. It's very technical, and I know I'm not the expert at them, and I don't want to be making those decisions here without really having more information, especially for looking at solutions and changes. And at the same time, we don't. We got to be really careful. At you know, I mean, there are a lot of components to it, mm -hmm. but all the time that they've been working to try and get a solution and they've been working to get a solution, there's got to be some time frame that we get them satisfied as well as the city satisfied. Yeah, well, and I mean, definitely everybody wants to protect our drinking water. Right, we well, even to, they do. Yeah, so, right. So um, I just, I don't know. I don't know if, Sorry. I'm, just, I'm just not convinced that you know, we are the right, I think we're the right place to bring information to, but I just don't think that we have all the expertise. So no, but I solution. Councilor Kenyon, go ahead. Next. Well, I understand exactly what you're trying to say. I think that it's really obvious from everything we've heard and read regarding this situation in the last 10 to 12 hours. Uh, it's unable to be resolved between the parties that are trying to resolve it. Although it kind of sounds like to me, and I just want a simple yes or no answer that this might be the first time you'd propose this new spot that works for the city. Yes, Rick and, and I actually got time to sit down and look at this and we came up with this literally a half an hour ago. Okay, so uh, I have never been given the opportunity to come up with a, a resolution or a a opportunity for an alternative. So, but you feel like what you're suggesting is work for the city's part. I think this will work for the city as well as the the Cusacks or the viewers. I apologize. And you agree? Well, can I ask you? you if you allow me to put on my transportation planner hat. <laughs> Where's it at? Well, you're under contract, so you certainly can. Um, so, well, granted, I'm I, I'm new to the situation, um, but when I look at the maps, regard pulling away from the conflict here, um, I don't like dead end roads. Um, while there's a lot to look into it, my first blush solution was to open that alleyway to connect. Uh, connect um, Jasper to Hill, to Hill Street. Then you would have a, a through a thoroughfare. Then you wouldn't need to turn around. You would be removing everything from the well field, eliminating that issue as well. That's a good idea. Um, it's narrow. That is a downfall. But so is Park Lane, which is just down the block. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Granted, <laughs> so before I go on, there is research, there is utilities in there um, that would need to be I would have to have a conversation with utilities um, to try to assess what the condition of those utilities are, how old are they, what was their original purpose, were they designed to be drilled and driven over. So those are the questions that are yet to be answered. But as a transportation planner, that's my that's my recommendation. To get the answers and see no, yeah, yeah. yeah. If 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 the answers were all in the favor of, I would say. Uh, um, unfortunately, can gravel because we don't have any road, road, uh, money for pavement at the moment. But it opened that alley up, then then you could have a you you flip through there that way. So um, it would no longer be a dead end street, right? Because it would collect, connect hills with Jasper. So now I really like Bobby's side. Yeah, I was gonna say I'm but, changing my mind. But there is a lot of but but don't jump on that. I mean, please, uh, so we have to go with fire hydrant because this was something that you know. This came to me, you know, since Wednesday, and you know, um, so I haven't had a lot of time to look into it. So if I had time to look into it, I might not have given you that answer. But nonetheless, that could be we could research that to find that out. But yes, like Jane was saying, there is a fire hydrant really close to that. Um, so, what would you think time frame to, to find your, out the answers? I could probably have, I could have an answer by the next council meeting. Oh. Councilor Coker. Kelly, how do you oh. feel about Robert's proposal on moving it down? Well, one of the things I was going to say was um, right next to the dry creek bed, which is right next to the well field that he was talking about having it 
where the dip is. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm not mistaken, if you're looking at that part, it's basically closer to my house on the on the front side of the dump truck. Mm -hmm. There is a narrow area that I'm seeing on the map that does not cross that water line. If I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. I'm looking at the red line right there. What if there was something that was just a straight through? You're talking about a straight pull through, but instead of, and, and this is again, Rick, once you go through all of your patch details, um, opening up just a small portion of that as like, um, they have all these different turnarounds. There's like the T and the Y and the, the um, yeah. So, yeah, so right next, you can't really see it, I mean, you can see it right next to this, the front of the dump truck, there's this little opening spot right here. It's just trees and bushes, but right there, you make this sharp turn and it brings you down into where the dry creek bed is. But right where all these little rocks are, there's this area that's outside of where that red line is that would probably be 30 feet wide and 100 feet long that's next to the, it's well beyond, it's 150 feet from the well house. But isn't that gonna be over the pipes? Well, that's what I'm, that's what yes. I was just looking that, at that. That would be over the pipes. That It would be best if I could go out there and draw or locate these actual pipes and show you all where they're actually yeah. at. I was it just looking at that. Thing. I could see because it. this is this was just put on the Google Earth with yeah. Yeah, I guess right here, you would, right at this point, you would drive over the line. But I'm talking about coming in right here and having this area right here be a place to turn in, turn around, leaving it open. Oh, you're not talking about it going like this. You're talking about just coming yeah. in. I mean, if, if that's it's creating a hammerhead turnaround. Yeah, if okay. we can't, yeah. because this area right here is like, and, and it's there's a fire hydrant and there's trees and there's poles. I mean, I think Rick will find it's going to be more of a headache. But this area pulls it. You could pull in and pull out and even have, if at all, minimal crossing of that line. I mean, that is that, so that that idea will actually absolutely work. But you will be on part of the you know, the city's well field. However, you're far enough away that that would be a great alternative and it's different even way. more than Yeah, um, it's basically where these rocks are, essentially. It's beyond. Right, it. They are, and then out. Yeah. yeah and those rocks are right up against the yeah. rubber trunks. Yeah. 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 One on second. Side. So, yeah. so I think it's eight o'clock when we need to finish what I was saying. Oh, I'm sorry. 15 minutes ago. Oh, I'm sorry. So I'd really like to just finish up that when I said I like Bobby's idea and I was talking. What I would like to suggest is that we put, maybe direct our city administrator to have his, whatever Rick's legal hat is with the city contract, meet with the brewers. brewers. So I'm really sorry I have <laughs> remembering names. The residents. And possibly if she's comfortable with it, having Robert also be present if I'm pronouncing your name right. I'm sorry. That's correct. Right. Um, but I just I don't I don't want to hear about any more conflicts. I'm thinking that maybe Rick is the ideal person to listen to everything, go out and look at the streets and talk about solutions and then solve that it. Great. And it might not even have to ever come back to it. I would love to never come back here again about this. And do this in a civil manner. I never not wanted to do this in a civil manner. Okay. I mean, I've, I've worked for the city yeah. for 20 years. I plan on retiring and I don't plan on jeopardizing my, my job in any way. So yes, I would be more than happy to go out there and draw the marks and show you exactly where you're doing this. Did you have anything else, Councilor Kenyon? Well, I just want to clarify that I'm really get what I'm really getting at is that um, she has an idea and he has an idea and to show and to walk through and see which is the better of the ideas with your input. You know? And if, I mean, if that means drawing lines in the sand, that's I guess a cue, but I'm hoping that it can just get solved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I 
I feel really similar to Councillor Kenyon. and I did not agree with Bobby initially, but after listening to Rick speak, I actually changed my mind. So this actually came to me in March. I initially threw it at Mr. Cronin and you can see it it's, it's kept going, multiple councillors involved. So I, although I don't think this setting is ideal for this situation, I actually am really happy with the way this turned out. And I think absolutely Rick getting together um, with the brewers, Robert, James, whoever, and if you guys don't come to a good compromise, come back. But I feel like you guys are on a, you know, got a I solution ready. Yeah, I agree. They have, they've talked about three alternatives here tonight, so. So if you guys feel good, yeah. I think we feel good. We can put this to bed and it'll come back if it needs to. But we're at the eight o'clock hour, so. I think it's great. A solution, of any solution is better than not, so. Um, Mayor, though, do we need to do a formal, um, direction to the city administrator to make all that happen? I don't or think so, it's changed his job. Making it clear. No. You, you could direct me to give you a status or, well, I, I can do that anyway, so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. We're, not, um, we're not gonna do the motion yeah. on here, so. All right. I think we have good, you guys are all good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Absolutely. So we are at the eight o'clock hour. Um, I really, initially when we changed our meetings to 6 p.m., the, Idea behind that was that we could be heading home at eight o'clock. So <laughs> go six now. Personally, I don't want to be here till nine o'clock, um, but I want to pull everybody, see how late they're willing to stay. I am willing to stay till 8 30, but there's not much left. Okay. There's, there's, nothing left there's not, not much left. Reports, right? yeah. and and 8 30. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Give me a call. Yeah, thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Okay, business from you. the city administrator. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, one, I wanted to welcome Rick Nostra. Uh, I sent out the announcement today. He has been hired as our full time community development director. Changed the name a little bit because he's our city planner as well as our community services director. So, to make it easier, we're calling community development director because it's development that he. Overseas. Um, I'll let you read the announcement. So just everyone is over the moon to have him back. He's a perfect candidate, and we're glad to have him back. Sorry, I'm sure I was going to read all exactly, but um, uh, also, it, it just so happens that uh, uh, two days ago we got a letter from DEQ officially rescinding their warning letter for the work yes. that we did. So happy to read that. You. Okay. Thank you. That was stressful. Yes, it's very much so. You're going to give him a fat head. <laughs> right. You can take it out of him. <laughs> um, otherwise, I just want to, you know, again, announcing that the town hall meeting for public mm -hmm. safety fee is Saturday, October 29th, 6 p.m. I sent everything, the flyers out to counselors to advertise that candidates form this Saturday, 6.30. And I have an event too on Facebook, so please share the event too, so that people click that they're going, and then it'll remind them in their calendar. Um, can I also get some printed copies of the? Uh, yes, they, I want to post them around town. Perfect. Yes, I, there's a stack right over there. All right. Um, I, hey, James. Uh, yeah. And, and Council Mayor, is the Council Mayor and everyone else done with the engineer? Yes. Sorry. Outstanding. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. It, it sounds like it's coming to a good outcome. Thank you, Ed. Appreciate it. Yeah, no, take care. Talk with you soon. I uh, just also wanted to uh, let people know if you have the announcement that just came out late this afternoon, Oak Ridge Air got even more mm -hmm. uh, purifiers for everybody. Again, it won't last long, but they are available. Um, I've been in touch with Walmart. They are seemingly from the discussions interested in helping us out with possibly donating some more. Well, hopefully, we'll have a purifier in every home very, cool. very soon. Um, what other, did I miss anything? Can I add a little bit to that? Yeah. Um, just from my agency that I work for. So, I know Senior Disability Services has been calling all of the clients in our area. And providing this resource and any other alternate resources that we have and that we know of to clients um, just so that they're aware. So we're trying to reach out to the most vulnerable people that we're aware of and 
can really provide that information as well. So that's what I'll do. Okay, cool. Uh, the only thing I have to mention is that, yes, we got these committee appointments uh, today, but we are still over 20, we have still over 20 open seats for multiple committees. So still keep trying to ask people. We've got two openings on the planning commission, which is a, a big one. Um, so yeah, keep trying to get people to apply. Uh, I've got three people that are supposed to be bringing you applications any day now. I think three planning commissioner seats that expire at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Oh, hopefully, yeah, hopefully. Should, yeah, just yeah. this is a side tangent, which I shouldn't do. But if we don't have a quorum on planning commission, what does that? What happens? We went over this. Yeah. James went over this a couple of months ago, and as it reads, um, the, it, it's a, a simple quorum. Or simple majority. Okay. Yeah. So okay. it's yeah. So if there's four, it's they have to have three votes. So it's it's who it's okay. I was kind of, I was splitting hairs with the two attorneys that happened to be in the room. <laughs> three of us arguing. Um, technically, <laughs> the way the other two interpreted it, because they represent clients from the planning commission, they wanted things to move forward. We thought, oh, there's not a quorum because there's only three people there. Technically, the way that's written, they said, well, it's of the seated members so the empty seats don't count okay so but that could lead us to to a situation where we have one person on the planning commission one yep. and the other six seats or whatever are empty then you'd have a 100 percent quorum every time that one person was there and it would be so and um, okay. while that is a very good point um we stumbled across the other day that uh in our code and ordinances uh city councilors could fill in those conditions does uh mm. number one can you share that ordinance ourselves? I'm sorry. Would we have to recuse ourselves if it comes to council later on? That's absolutely correct. If okay. the council no, you'd have to claim a uh um, an actual oh. no, no, um, no. ex parte. Oh yeah, and, and parte, it's, um, it's, yes. a, it's fixable. Yes, you have but to you have to go through the process. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, so you someone just suggested simple majority rules on that, and I have read the planning commission ordinance multiple times. I don't remember those words. Is it in our ordinance or some other jurisdiction? And but it didn't use the same uh, simple majority is more of a slang for what it used. Yeah. It was how it, well, it was of the seated uh, of the seated individuals makes form. So if there's only three seated individuals, those empty seats okay. don't count. That's how that's how we interpret it. So if there's only three people on the commission, you would only need two people. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. We don't need two people to and we only need two people to Okay. And uh, keep going with the rest of your uh, that that's all. Okay. Um we do need to meet again, you, myself, Don and Bobby for the public safety. Maybe if you guys have time on Monday or something to get back to our slideshow and that stuff, right? Yeah. Planning for the public safety. Um, I would have time Monday, but I'm out of town Tuesday, so it cannot get delayed. Or I Monday works for me. Tuesday, I'm going to be all day in the council. <laughs> Yay! I'm not going to get On three, one thirty to six. Oh my gosh! So it sounds like it's after three thirty on Monday would work. So let's just do three thirty. How about three forty-five? So three forty-five. A little break. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, staff reports? Are, are you done, James? I'm done. Okay. Any staff? Uh, well, I was gone most of the month of September, so the, the crews uh, performed all the duties that were assigned. That was cleaning sewers, um, big meters, taking care of delinquents while I went and played. Um, of course, the day I got back was when catastrophic things happened. <laughs> you yeah. Every single year it happens. <laughs> You got fast and they got evacuated. Is that what you're talking no, about? No, no. Wait, I was when the pipe broke. I was to on my hand so I could stay. Oh. So I stayed during that. And uh, well, you know, actually, I, there was three of us on the public works crew. That does all that. of the council even know about the big pipe break? Have we even had a chance. I mentioned to talk about that right. at the last okay. council meeting. Okay. Yeah, it was a big one. Just, just doing my job. Uh, <laughs> the uh, yeah, it was uh, 
the, the call came in and within 30 minutes, the reservoir had went from 28 feet down to 10 feet. <gasps> um, and at the same time, the city's well peel uh, had kicked on all of its pumps to compensate for the pressure loss. So the, the well field was pumping 1,400 gallons a minute. At the same time, the reservoir was draining. So it was well over 5,000 gallons a minute going out of that. It flooded the entire, yeah, it flooded the entire industrial or the entire camp up there. There were yeah. all the firefighters that were there were sleeping in water for, yeah. well, until we got it shut off. A couple of times for damage, we offered to pay for it. Was that so, on Kokanee or in the main big part down below? Right in the big part right down below. So where the pavement meets the gravel, so 20 mm -hmm. yards in, and it was a 12 inch main that split in half about 10 foot long split. That was. <laughs> It was the biggest water leak I've ever been in. It's the biggest one that the uh, engineers ever been a part of. The same pipe as by the street, right? Mm -hmm. No, ten inch. It's the same size, but it's not the same type. Oh, and that's, it's a different type of pipe that's down there. What would we have done if you were still out hunting? I mean, like I would have what? dropped what I was doing and got here, but. Uh, the crew knows where the valves are to isolate. That's they just wouldn't have been able to fix it as fast because they don't have the uh, the level of or ability. They can they can run the equipment, but not to the level that I have been able because I've done. So basically, until you retire, you can never go on a cell phone range, right? Until I'm going on vacation, and we'll go on vacation every September. At the same time. So every September, <laughs> we plan for the worst. And I, I do, I do that. I plan for when I do leave. Uh, make sure that I have an entire crew there. They're not allowed to take time off while I'm gone. They're not even allowed to take sick days. <laughs> I tell them that, but they know they can't. Uh, um, so no, the the crew is very capable of handling just about any leak. That leak was one in a million. Until the next one. <laughs> yeah. Well, with the way we fixed it, that one will never break ever again. I cool. took the plastic out and, and put a piece of ductile iron in its place because of where it crosses another pipe that's underneath it. And what broke it was the constant impact of vehicles traveling over the top of it. Anything else, Robert? Public works? No. Oh wait, yes, uh, all the rocks that were being hauled down there, uh, those were uh, came off the rock slide from, uh, <laughs> what is it, Deception Creek rock slide that covered the highway. Uh, ODOT donated them to us, uh, and I had to get them out of there before the rain came, so we got roughly $40,000 worth of levy repair rocks for free, other than my labor and the dump truck view. That's good because uh, that excavator got some yeah. yeah, I remember that love earlier that we had. I think it was like eighty thousand yeah, dollars that we was. it was a lot. Yeah. Yeah. We sat up there and watched you guys repair it. Yeah, and the one in two thousand ten uh was over three hundred thousand dollars. So that's why the storm let me increase that. <laughs> Rick, that's that's it for public um, I, um, I know I've been here since Wednesday. Um when so no, I sorry, don't have anything other than trying to put together some training for our planning commission. Um, but that's about all I have to share at the moment. Uh, fire department, we had 67 calls for service. Uh, five of those were fire related. 62 EMS calls with 36 transports. I uh, gave us a transport rate of 58%. Uh, training, I'm very happy to report that all of our um, drills lately have uh, had a pretty significant increase in attendance. And uh, a big thank you to Eric Higdon. He's been stepping up our training program and really making things a lot better and more interesting for people. So it's drawing people in. Uh, <clears throat> the group of us are attending the EMS conference in Bend this weekend. We are all awarded scholarships, so we get to attend for free. Uh, Christy and I received a grant from the Oregon State Fire Marshal's Office to attend uh, ASIP training, which is the assessing structural uh, ignition potential for, from wildfires um, at St. Clement Falls in November. Uh, and from that training, we should be able to go out and assess properties and be able to determine 
um, what types of things need to be mitigated to make them safe. Uh, we can also work with um, the FireWise program and assist them in their efforts. Uh, the grant pays for the course, lodging, meals, and fuel. <clears throat> Uh, some of the other grants that we're working on, the Oregon State Fire Marshal Apparatus Grant uh, should be ready to get completed in the next few days. And um, we have the potential of receiving three different types of fire apparatus from that grant. Um, and there's no matching funds, it's all paid for. <clears throat> we're also working on an Oregon State Fire Marshal uh, Capacity Grant, which would increase our staffing. Um, there's a potential to hire four full-time people for that grant. Um, the grant includes wages and all benefits and the cost to train those people if they need training to get up to the required level. Um, there is a match for the grant funds. That's 10% the first year, 25% uh, the second year, and 50% on the third year. However, we can use our volunteer time to offset those costs in a um, soft match. So it could potentially not cost the city anything for three years. Um, kind of the expectation of the grant though is to be able to um, fund it the fourth year, fully fund it the fourth year. We do have some um, things that we're looking at that could potentially provide that funding. Um, and so I will be bringing a proposal to council probably the next meeting because I need your approval to be able to submit the grant. Can you talk a little bit more about soft match? Because that's kind of a newer term. Um, instead of um, a hard match would be cash. We would have to put in cash. A soft match is um, you can use um, labor or other things like that to be able to, to match those funds. And we can use volunteer time at a dollar for dollar rate, the same as it would cost for a firefighter paramedic um, plus benefits. So those dollars will add up very quickly and should more than um, compensate for, for those percentages. So kind of like an in-kind match. Yeah, exactly. same, same yeah, yeah. thing, just different terminology. Scott, how many volunteers do we have now? Right now we have uh, approximately 15 volunteers. We just got okay. um, a group of six through the Firefighter One Academy. And then we have, I think it's four new volunteers that um, are just now coming in. Uh, we, um, Eric and um, Jim have been working on a training program for the next uh, six months. We're going to be doing another Firefighter One Academy and uh, Emergency Medical Responder Academy this winter. So we'll get through all those and should cool. hopefully have some trained people. That's encouraging. I don't know about anybody else, but after all the past things, yes, <laughs> that's very encouraging to me. Yeah, things are going very well. Good. You know, it's taking a little bit of time, but yeah, it's not going to happen in the right night. direction. Right. Anything else? That's it. Chief Martin, are you still on? Of course. So. Oh, there we are. Thanks for waiting. Yes, I am. Uh, Mayor, Council, and citizens. Uh, and thanks to the city administrator for letting me sit down in my office because I got quite a bit of work done while I was listening. Uh, productive meeting, I believe. Uh, so I, for, well, I don't know where to start. September was crazy, as we all know. Uh, <laughs> We spent a lot of time with fire activity and helping with evacuations and community awareness with the evacuations and then trying to keep people behaving while most of our citizens were back <laughs> out in the valley, which we did make some arrests for uh, people committing burglary. So that was a, a good thing. Uh, I want to put a shout out to Junction City PD. They did help us a little bit during the fire evacuations for some extra uh, police around along with several sheriff departments and a lot of OSP in the area from all over the state to help with that. Uh, we had uh, 327 calls for service that resulted in 28 major case reports. Uh, some of the things we did is we had a firearms training. Uh, Sergeant Madsen, Officer Miller and Officer Barrowland all went to smoke school. Uh, Lieutenant Ritz and I both worked at Oktoberfest. 
So Oktoberfest was a similar, they put a request out statewide for agencies to help. I helped one day and I think Sar Lieutenant Ritz helped all four days. And that is uh, in Mount Angel. That was helping Mount Angel Police Department. Uh, that's pretty much all I have. One thing I want, uh, without without saying year or date anything, I'd like the council to be aware of ballot measure 114 and ballot measure 112. You can go read those yourself. Uh, ballot measure 112 is the one that strikes slavery uh, from the Oregon Constitution. Uh, I know that's a strong word. Uh, maybe go read on the Oregon State Sheriff's Association. They're opposed to it. Just a quick rundown to that. That would keep a lot of our it would we would know law enforcement would no longer be able to use prisoners as road, work road crew working in jails uh, cleaning up the sides of the road that that bill will, will force sheriff departments to not be able to have to do that anymore so go read that on your own but just be aware it's a shocking bill it says strike slavery from that but that also means even if inmates volunteered they will no longer be able to do any of that if that if that passes Was so, that well 112, ballot measure 112. So you can read the brief on the Oregon State Sheriff's Association that explains it a little better. And then ballot measure 114 is the gun bill, and that will require us as a police department. It will be an unfunded mandate, and it will cost the city quite a bit of money. They believe it'll cost uh, cities in Oregon upwards of $67 million a year. Or let me. I think that was the first year, and then years after, I think it was 50, low for, or high 40s, low 50s for the cost. We would probably have to remove an officer from the road part time to do it because we will have to do all the background checks and start a system like concealed weapons permits for anyone that buys a firearm in Oregon. For, for us, it would be anyone that buys a firearm in Oak Ridge. So we will have to do all that. We're, it's required in the ballot measure. The city has to do that with no funding from anywhere. In fact, I believe the fingerprint costs are 60 some dollars and Oregon State Police gets 40 some dollars of that and the city would only get a couple dollars. So it's basically it will cost us money if that passes. I know uh, firearms legislation is an emotional thing, but it's, uh, it will be it will hurt the police department and the city as far as costs are concerned. So again, read that one on your own, make your own decision. but. Just wanted you to be aware of those two bills both affect law enforcement uh, quite, quite greatly. The 112 affects sheriff departments and uh, ballot measure 114 will affect all law enforcement in Oregon. Uh, with that, I don't have anything else such questions. Thank you, Chief. I have a question. Are you guys doing uh, your Halloween event here? Oh, thank you for reminding me, Merritt. I almost forgot about that. We're going to do a kind of trunk or treat at the PD. So uh, if you could pass that around and we're probably going to do something like scary jail cell where we let people come and take pictures with whatever decorations we have in there. I will be uh, having the city administrator in his reserve capacity to help with that. <laughs> Whether he likes to or not, that'll be part of his reserve duty for that. So sometimes I get to be his boss for a little bit. So. It's a personal car. <laughs> so, if there's anything else, uh, thank you, everybody, and have a good night. So, you're doing that at the police department? Yeah, we're going to we'll do the trunk or treat part outside, and then we're going to have a little scary hallway where they come down to the jail cells. And okay, what time? Uh, I had I I'm an in initial thought. We were going to do it probably around seven. I can't remember what time it's getting dark now. It's and you're actually doing it on Monday, Halloween. Yes, that's what, what our plan was to do on Monday, Halloween. And then we'll also be like we did last year. That's I'll say last year. I've been here almost 10 years now. And last year there was more people and kids out on the streets trick or treating than I've ever seen before. Probably maybe yeah. in any of the small communities I've worked in. It was we we ran out of candy fast just giving it out the windows of a patrol car last year. It was really good to see all those families out and all those kids out. So after we're done with trunk or treat, we'll be doing some patrols that and we have some reserves coming in and uh, I don't know if we'll have all staffing out that day, but most of it to help with uh, both our events and out in the streets, both patrolling and giving giving more treats out for those along. Thank you. Glad to hear you. Any more for staff? I did want to mention, I think it's important to mention at the council meeting that uh, 
due to Rick's now employment with the city, he is suspending his campaign for uh, city council because you can't be a city council and the full time employee at the same time. It was on my letter, but I forgot to mention it. I just want to make sure that's mentioned in during council sessions. Because people know that. Record. Anything else from councilors? Um, actually, I did want to ask if there's any updates that you can share with us regarding. Um, well, I guess I guess I'll just say it. It's the there's been an announcement by the city of Westford that they have a they're developing a fire department, and I read somewhere that they're taking a fire truck from us. Do we have any? Um, you know, I think that would be direct a information from our city regarding that matter. I think it'd be best if we put that on next meeting's agenda. I think it's a really fair topic, but there's a lot that goes into it. And I was actually going to suggest that we review the contract because there might be some violations of the contract. But I would say th things have been cordial. We've had good discussions, positive discussions. Um, okay. I think everyone has generally the best interest, citizens of Westburn and Oak Ridge in the area. So oh, sure. it's, it's, this is not a contentious issue um at least at this point and so yeah it, 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 but we do yeah, have a contract to look at and so we need to look at that too they have a contract with the city that needs to be I'm curious because I thought we owned all of our fire trucks so I was just surprised to see that uh West for has um they got a fire engine on a grant about eight years ago approximately and it's been stored at much longer than that closer to 15. 10 i don't know it's been a while they kind of <laughs> yeah. i actually think i lived in, in yeah, West they, Coast. they got it when i first moved here which was in 2000 okay so it's been longer than eight years <laughs> but um we've housed it in our station um almost since they got it and um we have in our contract it allows us to use that engine however um, we have another engine that's sitting in reserve that can replace that one so that part is not a big issue oh okay well i am interested to hear more when you guys yeah. are moving forward i think it's right. a good maybe next meeting sure. that's okay anything else from the other counselors <laughs> Okay. Public comment? Anybody? Go ahead, Chief Martin. Or is that an accidental hand? That's actually one I'm putting my school board chair hat on. Uh, just so everyone knows, we have uh, a school board vacancy. And if anyone is interested, both online citizens, uh, put that out there for us, please. And uh, if anybody's interested, please apply. And I, it's open until the Friday before our next board meeting, which is the second Monday in November. So I think that application period is open until uh, the 11th. So if anybody's interested, please put that out to friends and family. Uh, please put it for the school board. We could use the help. Thank you, Chief. Pauline, I see you're still logged on. Do you have anything? I do not. Okay. Any other public comment from Zoom? I'm looking for any hands raised. I don't see any, but if you don't know how to raise your hand, you can always unmute yourself. All right. Hearing no other public comment, meeting adjourned at 8.34 p.m. No. Good night. I'm going to wait for a day. I had one.